We have a quorum. Uh, we have uh, four members present in the room, and we have three um, attending now via Starleave. Just advise those who are in the room to, to adhere to um, social distancing during the meeting. Uh, today's business will include uh, consideration of subordinate legislation, with a briefing from NILGA with regards to the review of the implementation of the Planning Act, Northern Ireland 2011, and also a briefing from CBI Northern Ireland on the same issue. Um, just a reminder to those who are joining us remotely to um, raise the, your hand via the icon, um, just to register whether, wish you wish, whether you wish to ask questions or make a comment, um, and also if members could also mute their mics to avoid interference during the evidence session. Um, I haven't received any apologies, um, and I don't actually have any chairman's business. So moving then to the, tra the draft minutes, which are at page six of your packs for the meeting of the 19th of May. Are members content? Agreed. Moving then to matters arising at page 16. Again, that's from the meeting of the 19th of May. Um, do members have any issues which they wish to um, make in relation to that? I am conscious that a couple of members were unable to ask questions just due to the timings last week. Um, Mr Boylan and um, Ms Anderson, do either of you have anything that you wish to, to add at this point? Because obviously we had to cut you off um, quite abruptly. Oh. Mr. Boylan can't hear you. No. Miss Anderson? Okay, I don't think either of them. Oh, oh we've lost the system. We've lost them. Okay, well, we can maybe return to that if, <laughs> if the sound, oh, no. sound returns. Okay, moving then to um, page 20, which is outstanding committee requests. Um, for information. Okay. Any comments in relation to that? Um, sure. Um, Mr. I can't hear the system. Is okay. We can hear you now. Can you hear us? I'm sitting here. I'm, I can see it's all on the screen, but I'm not connected in. I can't hear the the, the sound. Me either. Neither can I. Okay. No one can. Okay, so we will try to get some kind of assistance in relation to that. Still no audio for us. Okay, okay so... Um, oh, no, yeah, I can hear you now, yeah, sorry. Okay, you can hear us now, great, thank you. Um, okay, just to, to, re to rewind a little. Um, with regards to last, meet, last week's meeting, um, both yourself, Mr Boyd, and, and Ms Anderson were unable to ask questions at the end just due to the timing. Is there anything that you wish to ask at this point, just to put on the record, that we can then um, include in our comments to the department? Uh, Chair, I don't, I don't, I don't have that work in front of me just now, um, so I apologise if I had realised I would have. So uh, I'll not put anything on the record at this stage, but I will submit in writing. Okay, thank you. Me, me neither, Chair. So I'll submit it in writing to the committee or to yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, just members are also aware that we agreed to um, a couple of informal meetings um, at last week's meeting. Um, so Coach Operators Northern Ireland and the Bus and Coach Northern Ireland Limited meeting will take place via Starleaf on Thursday the uh, 27th, that's tomorrow, at 10am. Um, the meeting has been, this has been arranged, obviously members have um, and will, if you haven't already received <coughs> your invitations to that via um, email, so if you could be in attendance at that, that would be very helpful. And the meeting with the Transport Hub Alternatives Group will take place at um, 10 a.m. on the 10th of June, and again, that's via Starleaf. And committee staff will issue the invitation for that meeting um, if they haven't already done so. Moving then to correspondence at page 29. Um, we don't have a lot of correspondence this week, um, which should be grateful for. 
um, there is uh, there is a grid there outlining um, how this should be dealt with. Do members have any commentary to make on any item of correspondence, Mr. Muir? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, on the outset, I would outline that over this uh, mandate as chair of this committee, I think you've been a very good chair of the committee. But I just wanted to note my disappointment that yesterday, under item 5.3, which was the North South Ministerial Council transport meeting, there was an important statement made by the minister yesterday to the chamber, and yourself as chair attended the chamber, but chose not to ask any question in relation to that and to discharge your responsibilities. So I wanted to note my disappointment in relation to that, and also to outline why that was the case. Okay, well, your comments are, are noted in relation to that. Um, anything further? No? Okay. Um, members are content then to to note the the correspondence. Chair, I'm sorry, Chair. Ms. Anderson. Um, yeah, Martina here. Now, Chair, I know you've said you've noted the comments, um, but I think on behalf of the rest of us um, who were also in the chamber and disappointed at particularly in discharging your function as chair of the committee, uh, whatever about your political view of um, North South All Ireland meetings, I think um, I think it would have been appropriate as the chair of the committee to ask the questions and I'm not sure just responding saying you noted today um, is an adequate enough response. Okay, um, and thank what you for that. The chair has to ask questions. Is there some protocol we're missing? Okay, um, thank you, thank you for that. And again, um, your comment has been noted. Moving then to um, item six, uh, which is the subordinate legislation, which are SL ones not subject to assembly procedure. At page fifty one, we have SL one, the road races, um, Cairn Castle Hill Climb, Order Northern Ireland twenty twenty one, and at page fifty three, we have SL one, the parking places, disabled persons, vehicles, amendment number four, Order Northern Ireland twenty twenty one. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Content. Okay. Moving then to item seven, which is SL one. The Motor Vehicles Driving Instruction Amendment Coronavirus Regulations Northern Ireland 2021 at page uh, 57. The proposal is subject to negative resolution. The Department pro proposes to amend the Motor Vehicles Driving Instruction Regulations Northern Ireland 2010 and the Motor Vehicles Driving Instruction Trainee Licence Regulations Northern Ireland 2010 to extend the validity of instructor theory test pass certificates which expire between May 2020 and the 31st of August 2021 from two years to three years. Um, we believe the proposed extension will enable affected part qualified instructors to complete the qualifying process and obviously this is something which the committee had requested as well so obviously this is I'm guessing this is welcome but are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Content. <coughs> okay, thank you. Moving then to item eight, which is SL1, the Motor Vehicles Driving Instruction Trainee Licence Amendment Coronavirus Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021 at page 61. The proposal is subject to negative resolution. The department proposes to amend the trainee licence regulations to increase the time from two years to three years as the time frame from when a person passes the theory test element to applying for the driving ability and fitness test. Are members content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Um, can, can I just ask for a bit of clarity because I have a couple of constituents who fall into that bracket. So is this rule um, telling those constituents who have passed their theory test that they are not subject to the time frame that was originally set, but it has been extended again for, for another year? Just for clarity. Well, the understanding is that it's being increased from two years to three years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So if members are content. Okay. Thank you. Um, just now in relation to the next three pieces of um, subordinate legislation, we do have departmental officials on standby. Um, are they yes, available? Okay. So we have... Um, Davy Miller, who is head of lands, and Derek Graham, who is civil engineer, DFI roads and rivers. So they're. 
So I think we may just have Davy <coughs> Miller. So we'll welcome Davy to the meeting. Davy, you're very welcome. Um, so hello, thank you. Can okay. you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Thank you. So we'll move then to the next item of business, which is SL1 Trunk Road T6A4 and Eskillen Southern Bypass Order Northern Ireland 2021 at page 65. Um, the proposal is subject to negative resolution. The scheme proposes to provide a direct link between the Dublin Road to the east of the town and the A4 Bell Coo Road to the west via the A509 Derry Lynn Road and onwards to Sligo. Um, David, just before, I mean, I, I'll open up to and see if others wish to ask a question. There were, there were two um, individuals who had objected to this rule, and, and I understand that the department did speak to them, but then consequently then moved forward then um, without a public inquiry. Can I just ask what the threshold would be for a public inquiry, and also how, if at all, the queries those residents raised were addressed? Okay. Um, well, Eric's with me today, so Eric's one of the engineers taking forward the scheme and, and play with the two objectors, which is a husband and wife uh, living in the one property. Um, if, if you're happy enough, I'll, I'll ask Eric to give a quick summary of the, the objection received from this couple uh, and his interaction with them to try and get their objections withdrawn and their concerns to relieved. And then I'll go on just to explain the process uh, of our decision to proceed without recourse to a public inquiry in this case. Okay, David, unfortunately, Derek isn't on the screen, so he isn't connected. So would, you be, would it be possible for you to do that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I can give you a short overview. So this, this is a, a couple during, during a consultation process and the statutory orders, um, we received objections and for few objections then that we couldn't couldn't um, uh, re allay their concerns. Uh, the objections came from a husband and wife in a property that's some 900 metres away from the scheme. So when the objections came in, we responded to their concerns by letter. And then Derek met with the couple at their property on the 28th of June 2018 to try to address their concerns and try to provide a bit more information uh, on the, uh, the scheme itself and how, how or how close their fire was from their, their property. So the, the meeting was amicable enough, but at the end of the meeting, uh, whilst they appreciated Derek's efforts, um, the, and the, I appreciate it on their own records at the end of the day. The impact on their property is not as significant as they thought it was going to be. Uh, they still nevertheless uh, didn't withdraw their objections. Uh, now we wrote to them again, asked them to formally withdraw their objections uh, and they confirmed by letter that their objections to the scheme still remain. Uh, the, property, the property itself is, as I said before, some 900 metres away from the scheme, uh, and only when the scheme was built, the, the, from the rear of the property was able to see the meters of the scheme, which is over the other side of Loch uh, uh, of River Earn, so some distance away. But nevertheless, their concerns were around possibility of light uh, and acting on their house from car lights, etc. So once, once you get to the decision, uh, once you get to a position where um, objections haven't been withdrawn to this, um, the local government legislation uh, advises that the department may convene a public inquiry if necessary. But if objections not withdrawn, then the department must decide if a public inquiry is necessary. So in circumstances where, for example, if we were taking land from people uh, or person for, uh, for a scheme, then you know we would normally plan or we would have a public inquiry so that person or persons could get their objections to the plan take um, be considered by an independent inspector. But in circumstances where there's no land taken involved, or the, the objections are purely to do with uh, monetary compensation, uh, and in this case, with some distance from the actual team itself. The department took the advice that would, in this instance, this, a public inquiry wasn't necessary and we were going to proceed without recourse to a public inquiry. Now, 
and, and making that decision um, at the divisional level, we write to the to landowners, the collectors, and advise them that we're minded to make to make a recommendation to the headquarters uh, for the scheme to proceed without recourse to public inquiry and offer them further opportunity to make further representations. Uh, they didn't make any further representation. When it comes to headquarters, then the the recommendation by division is considered by another director who's not directly involved with the implementation of the scheme or delivery of the scheme. Uh, and the case is then assessed and the decision in this case was that we would proceed with a recourse to public inquiry. Uh, but we wrote again, the director wrote again to the, the two landowners advising them that we were minded to do that and asked them if they want to take any further representations. No further representations were received. So the department took the decision in this case to proceed with a recourse to public inquiry. Okay. Uh, so you've had no correspondence um, since the minister's announcement or since your correspondence to, to no, the residents? No. Okay. No, no we, we did write to advise of our decision. That was our decision. We're going to proceed with a recourse to public inquiry and there was no response from them from that date. Okay, thank you. Any other members wish to ask Mr. Buchanan? Just, just a question, I suppose, Davy, in general, regarding vesting of lands. I'm experiencing lots of issues in the A32, I think it is, A31 possibly, Markerfeld Bypass, and subsequently A6. Where landowners obviously get lands vested possibly maybe three, four, five years ago approximately, but they go through difficulties, and a lot of them are farmers by trade, and farmers do word of mouth transactions in a lot of the cases with BFI officials, and X, Y, and Z was agreed. Four years later, when everything is to be finished or completed, the official has moved on. Maybe so. It's, it's how you engage with landowners, and uh, you know you obviously have land agents, but there seems to be a, a sort of a breakdown in communication. In that process, and then four or five years down the line, when all is happening, the things that was agreed are not subsequently completed or you know finished for the farmer. How do you, how would you improve that that whole situation and that whole flow of information? Yeah, well, well you're right. There, there, is, there is often delay between when we're actually designing and, and, and pulling together all their information, meeting with the landowners, agreeing their accommodation work, and then moving forward to the actual scheme, complete, starting on the ground. But all, all those meetings are documented. All the accommodation works are agreed. The landowner is allowed to appoint the agent to represent them uh, through those accommodation works meetings and, uh, and then through to the compensation at the end of the scheme. So it, it is all documented. It, 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 it's the way of life that people retire and move on and we have to deal with it. But it is, it, it's all documented and when the engine, when they, the scheme comes along, the contractor have they have their lands liaison officers deal direct with the landowners. We really visit them again, meet with them again, see if anything has changed, um, see if circumstances have changed, um, and just you know, to, to pick up again where we left off so the scheme can progress on. We are to, we try to be as flexible as we can with landowners. The contractors try to be as flexible as they can with landowners because we want the scheme to proceed without least hassle and inconvenience to them. Um, but I, I, I think they're coming on board and I'll, I'll convey them on to the relevant uh, directors for the, the scheme. Fair enough, thank you. Okay, thank you. And those attending via Starleaf, have you any questions in relation to this scheme at this point? No, no hands up. Um, Mr. Muir. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, this is in relation to item nine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, just, just one question. Um, the within the schemes, so I had a look at it online, and there's uh, within it, it has a shared walking and cycling path. Now, um, obviously, that's been given a lot more profile recently because that is not what is recommended um, as the the best design in terms of having that. I just wanted to see. Does that proposal meet the department's own guidelines, and why was this being why is this being considered as part of the scheme? Uh, I have to apologise. We, uh, we came along this, this morning, and we, we're there. To, we're here to talk about the objections. Um, if if, it, if your questions extend on to the scheme itself or design and stuff, I will need to get uh, either engineers to come back and talk to the committee again. Or if they, if they want to write to us, we'll respond. 
Okay, no, that, that, that's fair enough, actually. Maybe what we will do is maybe put that in writing then um, through to the department for a response. If you're not prepared for that, for that, that type of question, that's fine. Anyone else wish to ask anything at this stage in relation to the scheme? No? Okay, thank you. So are members um, content with the proposal for the statutory rule? Agreed. Moving then to item 10, um, which is SL1, the um, River Arn diversion of um, the water course and um, extinguishment of the public rights navigation order, um, Northern Ireland 2021, it's at page 70. And then at SL1, the River Arn and River Sillies bridge orders, Northern Ireland 2021, at page 73. The uh, proposal is subject to negative resolution. The, following the Minister's approval to proceed to progress EA for Enniskill and Southern Bypass Scheme in readiness of funding becoming available, the Department for Infrastructure proposes to make statutory rules under Articles 4, 5 and 6 of the Roads Northern Ireland Order 1993 to facilitate the construction of the River Arne and River Sillies bridges and the necessary diversion and extinguishment of public rights of navigation on the River Arne. <coughs> the bridge orders are being made under Article 4 of the Roads Northern Ireland Order 1993 and the diversion and extinguishment of navigation order in being, is being made under Articles 5 and 6 of the 1993 Order. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rules? Agreed? Yep. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, which one um, for the T6? Well, item 9, can we just... Oh, item 9. Yes, we did. Are all members content? We, did we do it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, okay, just, just to clarify, are members content with the proposals in item 9, 10 and 11? All agreed? Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, David. <coughs> thank you. Okay. Okay, bye. Check, bye. bye. Moving then to um, subordinate legislation, SR is not subject to assembly procedure. Um, there is one statutory rule not subject to assembly proceedings at page 76. Um, S, and again, so at page 76, we have SR 2021-128, the parking and waiting restrictions for Crumlin order, Northern Ireland 2021. Um, Members, uh, if you're content to note, unless you have any issues um, wish to raise with regards to this proposal, Are members content with the SR. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving then to our the first of our briefings, um, and we're going to hear from the Northern Ireland Local Government Association with regards to the review of the implementation of the Planning Act, Northern Ireland 2021. Hansart will record the meeting. At page 84, you will find Nilga's submission, and we'll welcome uh, via Starleaf. We have Karen Smith, Head of Policy and Governance of the Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. We have Stephen Corr, who is a councillor at uh, Belfast City Council, and John Linden, who is Head of Planning. Newton Abbey, uh, Antrim, Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council. So you're all very welcome to um, the meeting this morning. Uh, Karen, can I defer to you th um, to um, make the opening remarks and for you to bring in colleagues um, when that's suitable to do so? Thank you. Yes, thanks very Thank much, Chair. If I can maybe bring in Councillor Corr, who's leading the delegation this morning. Okay, so thank you, you can't. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just, first of all, just like to thank your, your, you and your, yourself and your committee colleagues for the invitation to meet with you this morning. Um, my name is Councillor Stephen Corr. I, I am from I sit in Belfast City Council, and I am currently chair of the Nilga Place Human Infrastructure Policy and Learning Network. Uh, this network helped develop the, the Nilga response to the, the departmental call for evidence, which I understand that the committee has been uh, have been circulated amongst your committee. Today, I'm accompanied by John Linden, the, the Head of Plan and Andrew and Newton Abbey Borough Council, who is an advisor to our network and who has worked collaboratively with Milka for many years, particularly since planning services transferred to councils in 2015. Also, as you mentioned, by Karen Smith, who is the Head of Policy at Milka and provides support for our network. 
Uh, today I want to keep want to keep these comments quite quite brief, Chair, so we can have more time for discussion. But I just wanted to touch on a couple of issues first, so that the committee is fully aware of the areas of most concern to local government in, in relation to this review. Firstly, I have to say that although we're very much, we very much welcome the review and are glad to see it underway, it is not without some disappointment for councils and that we it just didn't go far enough to address the issues we face as local councillors and as local councillors uh, across 11 different councils. Nilga and our member councils are very aware of the criticisms of the planning system that was commenced in 2015. I won't say unheard of because, as you know, the system that councils took on that year was completely new and un untested, un uncharted water, so to speak. We hope that this review will address at least some of the issues that have emerged over time since then. As elected members, you, you will be as frustrated as we are in councils by the fragmentation of place shaping functions in, in, in the north here. Responsibility for regeneration, public transport, local roads, housing, green spaces, rivers, all sit with different different places in government here, although most of these functions and services are in the, in the local government hands in other jurisdictions. Um, nicely and under nicely enabling, which enables our integrated place shaping approach at local level. The readiness to deliver proper place shaping at local level in the north is, I believe, one of the main reasons behind the criticism the planning system receives. Uh, the delays that are built upon into our system, uh, sorry, the delays that are built into our system are non-existent and completely unnecessary elsewhere. Nilga is keen to see a much wider review of local government reform, encompassing planning. To achieve what to achieve that the were the initial aims of, of the RPA to provide a proper suite of place shipping powers in the proper place in councils and to realize local government as the local leaders and service delivery bodies they should be they could be and in fact are elsewhere but it would accept that there was low confidence in councils taking on planning back in 2015 even to a certain extent this belief that transfer would, would ever happen I believe that our councils are doing the best job they can do with the system as, as it is designed. It is now imperative that we review the legislation and make uh, the improvements that, that, can ha that can be made with this light touch review. We need to improve the development plans process, the enforcement process, and as a priority, improve the validation system for planning applications. We need less departmental intervention with less prescriptive planning policy and a more streamlined call in process. Much of this can be achieved by legislative change, as outlined in our written response. Now, as I've said earlier, I want, as I want to keep this brief and as much as I could go on in detail, I would leave it there and hand back to, your, hand back to you, Chair. Uh, John, Karen, and I look forward to any questions or, or commentary you, you just have at that stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, for the paper um, that the, the, the committee have received. And you have referred to this as a, a light touch review. And you've also referred to the fact that you feel that an independent expert um, review is required. Um, could you perhaps um, highlight your concerns in relation to um, how this is being approached um, and how you feel that an independent expert review might um, produce um, so better outcomes for you? Okay. I was going to bring in John there. John, if you want to come in and answer that, please. Thank you. Uh, to the Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yep. The, I think one of the concerns that's been raised at this stage is that while there was a review mechanism built into the legislation after five years, uh, the department has indicated that they don't feel this is maybe the, the correct time to do uh, a more written branch review and, uh, as I say, take a more light touch to see if there's some elements that can be changed at the fringes that will assist the system, which we do support. Uh, nevertheless, I think five years in, uh, there's some evidence to show that there uh, is increasing frustration among certain elements of the legislation and how it operates. And at the very least, um, I think the response that both Mill has put in, the 11 councils have put in themselves and other uh, stakeholders, I think is indicative that there are a range of areas that the department needs to give serious consideration to. Um, we should a, a complete review of primary legislation is never first straightforward or simple. Uh, but at the very least, um, I think what councils are uh, demonstrating is there's a need maybe for somebody to come in independent of that process and highlight the main areas uh, that should be taken forward as part of a plan review uh, in the future. And that's based on the comments through uh, now we'll to uh, the committee. Okay. And, and, and Sorry, Chair, through you, if I can maybe just come in. I mean, certainly in, in the Nilga response, um, what we were hoping was that um, we would have um, what we would term as an augmentation review of local government reform. Um, because we're aware there's so many functions that we're supposed to transfer to um, 
fulfil the, the place shaping brief that councils would have elsewhere and um, that haven't transferred, but that extends beyond planning legislation, that extends beyond um, the, the Local Government Act even, and needs to bring in um, other um, pieces of legislation that um, haven't quite surfaced yet. Um, so it needs to be a wider piece and it needs to be cross-departmental as well. Okay, so in, in the absence of that, um, what would you be hopeful to get out of this process? Um, so really, what would what would your priorities be? Because I know that you have you've touched on quite a number, and we are all cons we, I suppose we as a committee were concerned that there there are that there are issues. But um, coming out of this, what would you be hopeful for? Um, Chair, through you, um, I think um, really uh, this is about improving what we've got at the moment and what how, how we can improve the legislation that's there. Um, we've made um, practical um, uh, suggestions for, as to how to do that in the in the, uh, the piece that you've got, and that extends. Um, I mean, certainly, our, our members are particularly um, keen to improve the validation process and the, um, the sort of planning application system. Um, but also, there are um, means of um, improving the, the planning uh, local development plan system. Maybe if, if um, I could bring John Linden in just to sort of touch on. I know that. And the heads of planning had sort of articulated about 10 priorities, but not maybe too, too many to go into. Maybe we maybe highlight, John, the, the top three or four. That would be useful. Mr Chair, um, thank you, Karen. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset from the planning perspective, and I endorse the comments Karen made, there, there is this a wider frustration that obviously when planning transferred in 2015, uh, other functions didn't. And the stitching together of that, that is difficult, but that's a, a wider ranging uh, review that uh, might be needed in the future. Specifically on the planning review at the moment, um, I think some of the concern relates to the fact that um, you've got both primary legislation, subordinate legislation, and uh, policy and guidance. Um, and some of those are easier, to we say, in the context of uh, if the ministers uh, announced this is more light touch review, uh, we would certainly be um, pushing that subordinate legislation and policy and guidance is something important and hopefully could change relatively speedily. Primary legislation is more fundamental. Uh, however, the, the core uh, that has come up consistently from councils is concerned with the local development plan uh, process and particularly the time taken to move that forward. That, I think, is uh, recognised would require a more fundamental and branch review. Uh, because we're bound, obviously, by the terms of the uh, primary legislation. Maybe certain elements of that can come th through uh, a revision of the regulations that accompany that, but there is a, an overall concern about how that uh, system is progressing. I think the concern that's highlighted in the documents uh, forwarded to the committee have indicated that when the new system is introduced, uh, the requirement will be somewhat, um, uh, hopefully, it indicated they thought uh, a full new plan for a council could come out in some three to four years at adopted stage. That's the two stage process. We're already almost six years into that process, and so we haven't got one adopted uh, plan strategy document. And there's a variety of reasons for that, not just the legislation. And again, it's outlined in detail in our response. So those concerns relate to uh, interaction with the department, an over bureaucratic approach and the relationship with elements of the strategic plan and policy statement and uh, how we engage with some of the consultees in relation to the work we're undertaking. And there's certainly that frustration evidence to this council. Uh, we are at the stage we've not got a, a draft plan strategy document, hopefully going to independent examination later this year. Currently, the department will really sign off for that. But by way of example, the fact that legislation requires us to submit that document to the department for them to agree for to go to the Planning and Peace Commission uh, to do the inverted commas independent review in our independent appellate body. And then at the end of the process, that independent appellate body has to report back to, again, the department. And that process is very unique to Northern Ireland, but it is time consuming. There are just delays that most local government uh, colleagues would think is uh, unnecessary. Um, so that may be a, a more wider ranging review that's needed and may not be able to be encapsulated at this stage. The certain frustrations witnessed by the councils and evidence in our responses to the department is something we think the committee should take note of and, and press the department for consideration of maybe a more fundamental review linked in with a maybe wider, uh, as you say, independent review of elements of the planning process. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
In, in relation to the other areas which we think could be acted upon now, and Karen mentioned one, uh, there's a significant frustration uh, within councils about the validation of planning applications. Uh, as things stand at the moment within statute, to have a valid application, uh, you literally need to put an application in, sign it, and pay the fee, and that's it, and the clock starts running. And I think members of the committee will be well aware, maybe from previous experience and what they hear today. And um, there's often, in many cases, we get applications in with insufficient information to allow us to actually properly determine it. And we play a game of catch up with agents and applicants. Uh, having to request, or sometimes on multiple occasions, information that's necessary to allow us to determine an application. In other jurisdictions, um, freedom is given uh, through legislation for councils to bring forward their own validation lists to say, before we register an application and begin to process it, you need the following documentation. That would be proportionate to the type of application. Obviously, for house extension, we not, may not require significant information, uh, but for a larger scale housing development or economic development. There are many assessments that are generally required uh, for many of those applications. And we still today often get applications without those assessments and promises that they will come shortly thereafter. And maybe two months down the line, we get that, but we've lost two months of processing time. And that causes frustration, not just for us, but also for statutory consultees, because they get consulted in the application, come back and say, we haven't got the drainage assessment we require, we haven't got the ecological appraisal we require, we haven't got the information we need to, to give you a response. And um, so that's a good example of, of uh, hopefully an issue that could um, very quickly and easily uh, progress applications through the process. There's equally a frustration linked to that, that when we get information in and get to a stage potentially where applications are refused, and we shouldn't over-egg that. In, in this council, for example, some 5 to 6% of applications ultimately are refused. And again, this council, all refusals are actually taken through the members of the planning committee, so they're endorsed by the members of the council. And yet we end up in an appeal where the Planning Appeals Commission accept new information as part of the appeal and fundamentally changes the, uh, the situation of the application. Things we might have been requested from the applicant during the processing and here we get it lastminute.com. The legislation that came forward, we understood was intended to prevent that from happening, but that is not the case because there are two legislative elements in the Planning Act which in part contradict each other. Uh, one says that um, it, you should only submit additional information and pay exceptionally, and yet there's another provision that the PAC would advise says they have to take on board all material considerations in front of them, which may include additional information. And it ended up, there was case law on that, uh, tested through Belfast City Council that um, illuminated it somewhat and made life a little bit easier, but there's still a, 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 an outstanding frustration uh, among the planning colleagues that uh, people play the system, so to speak, play catch up at the end of the process. Um, another example, and I'm going to pause there to see, I want to go through all, all issues because some of us may come through questions from uh, members. Um, we have a, a, a provision where some of the checks and balances that were put in uh, the legislation from the department's governance rule are deemed to be, again, frustrating or causing undue delay in applications. Uh, one example is that were uh, the department or were the council make a decision and there may be an objection from the consultation on a larger scale application or certain applications have to be notified again by statute to the department. Um, they have a, a potential uh, call-in procedure. On occasion, when certainly in early days, there was frustration that that call-in was taking, in some cases, two to three months. Often, um, it ended up and resulted with the department responding to the council who were not calling it in. But then, by statute, there's a requirement to have a predetermination hearing on the application. When the, the council has already given, if you want to put this initial review, we have to go back through the process and then even after that predetermination hearing have a further committee hearing to actually make the decision and, and uh, I suppose to put it politely most people think it's nuts and um, it, it just significantly delays the process one example in our council was where an application was referred to the department it was two to three years ago but we waited 12 months for a response from the department to eventually get a response saying no we're not calling it and you can proceed with the application it took us another three months to get out the door. That was a 15-month delay in the process of that application. 
So I'll pause there. There are four <laughs> and I think the uh, papers were submitted to the committee and I'm happy uh, to pick up the as we go forward. Okay, thank you very much and thanks for that very detailed response. Um, uh, I'll maybe now open up to other members, so if I call, it, call the Deputy Chair, Mr David Hildage. Thanks, Chair, and folks, you're very welcome to the committee this morning. Uh, just on the last point there, in relation to departmental responses, should there be a, a time limit on that uh, to try and make these departments uh, bring their information forward a bit quicker? What's your thoughts on that? You okay, John? The commander. Yes. Uh, well, I think the, the view is uh, I, I give an example there, and I do recognise the department um, has, shall we say, improved a lot in recent times. I think the frustration is while the response time of the department can be improved, and that's a matter of resource, and then addressing the issue in front of them. Uh, the subsequent issue, which is even in those cases, we then obliged by legislation to have a predetermination hearing if they decide not to call the application in. And that simply adds more time to the process. And that's one area we've uh, certainly asked uh, as councils and through Nova as well that the uh, mandatory provisions for pre-termination hearing uh, should be reviewed as part of this review. Would you like um, your... Chair, if I can maybe come in on that as well, just to widen out the discussion in relation to departmental involvement. I mean, obviously, our primary um, relationship is with um, the planning um, part of, of DFI, and there are I mean, um, sort of constant conversations um, with that, that part of the department. But what I would say to you is and there's a, a, an important conversation in relation to resourcing as well, um, given that, I suppose, um, the cost of planning has never really been fully covered um, by uh, the, the resources that were transferred to crisis at the time in 2015 and certainly now. Um, there's been no review of planning phase and also um, the involvement of statutory consultees has been um, subject to a review by the department and one of the suggestions we've actually brought up in our response is potentially how, how do you better resource the statutory consultees. I mean I don't think that there was a, a confidence that planning would actually transfer in 2015 and um, as a result I don't think that the statutory consultee parts of government staffed up um, to cope with 12, what is now 12 planning authorities. Um, so I think that if we can have a, a focused look at how to resource the statutory consultees better so that they can actually do what they need to do, um, alternatively or maybe possibly as well, um, there's also the option to enable councils to staff up internally if they have the resource and are willing to put the resources into the system um, locally um, to provide those expert skills um, within in-house rather than having to go to numerous um, parts of other government departments to have um, views put in. So that could again speed up the process, but it, it is, it's a resourcing conversation that's required on that. Okay, thank you. Uh... There's other things you highlighted there, John. You've given a very detailed outline to those, the questions that I had anyway. Uh, just on demolitions and cons conservation areas and probably present a local and a, not a regional issue, could you just to further develop that statement as a, as a more local issue for the uh, demolition and conservation areas on, as a regional issue? Um. The issue comes down to do you view um, as an assembly that the uh, councils are best placed to um, deal with issues in the local area? Um, so most council areas have at least one conservation area, maybe uh, several. Um, and the issue around demolition, it doesn't arise that often, uh, but there are issues whereby if demolition consent were to be granted by the council, um, again, the council cannot actually issue that. It has to notify the department and the department's company are content with that effectively. And the oversight role, uh, the issue is, is that actually necessary? And um, if the staff here, uh, in terms of making a recommendation, and ultimately if the members have agreed a recommendation, it goes in front of committee. And um, like, again, the frustration is uh, that should be left to the council uh, to get on with. And um, that's always in the context that the department has calling powers. It's the, it's the automatic nature of doing this in that uh, we were bound into that process as opposed to the department exercising its responsibilities when there's a particular issue in hand. So clearly if the 
council was minded to allow demolition of a very nice building in the conservation area, and there's wholesale adverse reaction to that at a level whereby the department's been contacted and they think, um, you know, we're just allowing that willy nilly. They have that call in power and can exercise it. In many cases, what we're dealing with are buildings uh, which are maybe not of um, import in terms of the conservation area. Not all buildings in conservation areas, obviously, are uh, at the level that um, they, they make a positive impact on it. Uh, so even if it's a, a building um, that has no particular import uh, and demolition consent is agreed by the council linked to a redevelopment proposal, we automatically have to go to the department. And I think, again, the frustration there is it's another instance of uh, the department taking an approach which doesn't apply anywhere else in the UK or on, on the island, but we're obliged to go and uh, get sign off on those issues. Okay, thank you, John. And as I say, the, <clears throat> the other questions have been answered, so thank, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair, Karen, Stephen, and John. Thanks very much for coming along remotely. Um, this is probably a question for um, Karen or Stephen. See, your reviewer had the meeting on the 25th of March. Uh, place, shape, and infrastructure was was all councils. The eleven councils represented there. I, I can't remember off the top of my head if they all were, but I think the, the majority would have yeah, been. Uh, yeah. We we'll need to just uh, check back with the attendance list, uh, Mr. Buchanan, just to uh, verify that, and I can get you that information after the meeting. So, 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 Karen, just on that. So, obviously, the majority would have attended to be fair, and then other councils then would have fed into you. I presume it's you, Karen, to put this document together with all their concerns or issues. Let's call it. Sure. Um, essentially, what we did was um, we um, worked um, very closely with a number of the planning officers. I worked closely with the heads of planning in the councils um, to make sure that we cover um, local issues. So, for example, you see um, issues in our paper about agricultural buildings, and that has kept come up from, um, for example, Middle East Antrim Borough Council. There's a lot of um, information there from Belfast. And we work with John and his colleagues very closely to um, refine how we. Um, uh, put the information forward. Um, obviously, our um, organisation is elected member led, uh, and so Councillor Corr uh, chaired the meeting on the 25th. With um, uh, we met with Angus Kerr and Aaron Kennedy from the department to go through the review and have a detailed discussion about what the concerns were. And there were officers and members available from most of the councils. Uh, uh, there is an re elected representative on. Uh, the place shipping and infrastructure network from each council. Uh, unfortunately, elected members being extremely busy, uh, they don't always um, come to every meeting. Um, and um, our um, planning officers are all also extremely good attenders, and we make sure that we have professional advice at meeting. Thank you for that. Just, I have sort of two points: one on, on consultation bodies, and the other one on enforcement. See the consultation bodies. Can you give me put a little bit of meat on the bones and refer to your comments? And maybe I presume John could be best placed to answer this in regard to uh, many consultation bodies that we communicate out with here, where, where in the mainland it's slightly different. Could you just give me some or background on your, on your comments? Um, there's two related elements to that, uh, through the chair. One relates to the local development plan process, and you may pick up a, a frustration that, um, as things stand at the moment, there is a list of particularly infrastructure providers and electronic communication code providers, which runs to something like over 100 uh, groups across the UK. Uh, because these people are licensed across the UK, then at the moment we're obliged to uh, only consult with them through the development plan process at various stages. That's very bureaucratic, given that I know in relation to our plan, uh, we got one response from a code system operator around our sort of antenna policy for telecommunications development in our borough. And I think one of the suggestions we made was it may be reasonable to, uh, at the start of the process, uh, advising people were setting off in a process of preparing a local development plan. But unless they engage or indicate they wish to engage through the process, we can then drop that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a level of unnecessary bureaucracy. Um, in relation to the plan process, and then more probably importantly, the uh, the process in relation to planning applications. Uh, as Karen pointed out, we're obliged to consult with a variety of bodies that we've been well aware of, DFI Roads, uh, Northern Environment Agency, um, Historic Environment Division for Heritage Issues, uh, the Rivers Agency, Northern Iron Water, etc., etc. And those consultations are important. 
Um, one frustration I said earlier was obviously if we don't have the correct information with the allocation at the start, then um, it's very difficult for these entities to respond. Um, the second issue is, uh, as Karen pointed out, uh, some councils, not all councils, would like to have the potential use in-house resource that obviously requires recruitment and additional funding to do that. Um, and use, as you find in other jurisdictions where the rules authority, the drainage authority, the strike environment people all actually work for the council and work together. It's together the approach in terms of pace making, but also having that um, ability to control the consultation process internally um, in a much better way. Um, so the resource issue down for the consultees externally, and we're very good working relations with them, and we're continually trying to see ways of improving that process can lead to frustrations. Some of those arise irrespective of this review. Um, the one that uh, professionally and personally always causes me a problem is that when objectors who are opposed to development uh, use the magic words, I think I, I saw evidence of some on this site, or, or badgers, or bats, then we're into uh, having to get ecological appraisal undertaken often. And for some of those, surveys are required and they're confined to particular periods of the year. Unfortunately, due to case law, we're required to do that. But it, it, it all builds up a, a more frustration to the consultation process. I, I should say, however, um, that doesn't mean that the councils aren't actually uh, working the system uh, rigorously at the moment and producing the goods. Even with those constraints, many councils are um, uh, issuing uh, many of their decisions in a timely fashion. And indeed, um, I would still say, sorry for this council, in a more timely fashion than when ours rested with the department, because the council has been able to bring um, its views to bear on how we deal with that internally, how we deal with our external clients, how we deal with the applicants, and hopefully have improved the process. But there are still frustrations there, and there's further room for improvement. Thank you. Um, John, you referred earlier, and you heard there again, that answer about the application process. What powers does councils have? Say I submit an application tomorrow, and it's not completed correctly, and you talk, refer to the, the clock was ticking. How do you, you know, to prevent you running after me, what process can you put in place, or powers have you got, so that not, the clock doesn't start to tick until all the boxes are ticked? What, 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 how, can you, how can you manage that? And I'm not saying you're doing it wrong, but how can councils manage that better? And what powers have you got to say, no, applicant, that's incorrect? We, we can't process that. Because if you're filling in an application for a, a passport, if it wasn't correct, you've got to send back straight away. Yeah. Mr. Buchanan, through the chair, um, very limited powers. If an application, a planning application comes in um, on the form, signed with the correct fee, then by law we must validate it and we must validate the date it came into us. So even if we only validate it for whatever reason a week later, the registration date starts from the date it was submitted to us and that becomes a valid planning application. Um, and for many applications that would be fine, say for house extension we may not need a whole lot more. And indeed with some of house extensions, having worked with the agents here locally, they're, they're they're well aware of what we look for. So we want to see if there's a neighbouring property uh, and what some details of that shown on our drawings to show daylight, sunlight implications, and um, not that they just do it in the context of the site. And they get that and they, they, they produce the goods and we move on. But once you get into even single houses, we may just simply get, for example, for a rural application, a uh, red line around the site, be paid and uh, signed form with no indication of what grounds that application has been made under, which policy they're trying to meet, um, have they assessed whether there's any flood risk on the site, uh, and so forth. So effectively what we do in terms of some of our major applications, try to front load that system, what we're saying by bringing validation lists, that would give the councils the power to front load at that stage. When we get an application in that is invalid, for example, if it is incorrect, we don't just send it back we will ring up the agent applicant and give them generally in this council four to five days to rectify that and then move the application forward. Uh, after that, if they haven't, then we would return the application as effectively an invalid application. If the application is made valid and we then subsequently, our power is to ask that information. Um, it doesn't always happen on day one. 
officers get many applications and they're doing very different issues. They may not pick up on it for two or three weeks and then realise we're going to need this, we're going to need this assessment, we're going to need this information, we need more from the applicant that they requested. One of the powers of um, the council has been working closely with our members here. They've delegated authority to us that if applicants don't submit that information in a timely fashion, that we then potentially can refuse the application for insufficient information. Um, but in the real world, unfortunately, you get it, look, it is coming or look, look for a bit more uh, time to do bits and pieces and we move on. But we've lost the time at that start, start of the process. And it could be six weeks in before we get the information we actually need to begin to actually properly process the application. Meanwhile, I say the clock is wrong. So simple answer is there's actually very little we can do in terms of making an application valid. Uh, but the situation in other jurisdictions is they've been given the authority to bring more local validation to this thing, which then can allow us to work with the agents and reinforce them. You need to bring this information, or as much as we think we can get at the start of the process then, and only uh, after the processing of something crops up, we need further information, should we be requesting it at that stage. Okay, I'll, I'll, the chair gave me a look there, John. I don't know what that meant, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Boylan. So. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and, and you are very welcome. Um, John, you give some comprehensive answers there. I mean, that's the most of the questions. Uh, but I just want to pick up on, on, on some of the, the other issues. The local development plans, I mean, obviously the time frame for them has moved from four and a half years to nine years. And I'm just wondering, there seems to be uncertainty around the process itself and the level of evidence required to support the adoption of the local development plans. Do you think that guidance and legislation should be clear, clearer on this here matter in relation to developing these plans and getting them out there? Uh, Mr. Boyle, thank you for your question. Uh, through the chair, um, it's a difficult area um, because we are where we are. Um, many of the councils are now getting to the stage of getting the first stage uh, of their plan uh, into an independent examination process, which we hope will result in those and strategies coming forward for adoption in due course. There were certain reasons behind that. Uh, one reason being, my understanding from the initial legislation was that the plan strategy document was meant to be a short, concise, say 20, 30 pages, high level of what is your strategy for your area, what are your growth ambitions, and what evidence you got to support that. However, the planning policy statement then made it clear when it was published that at the time the plan strategy is adopted, all the planning policy statements will fall for that borough and local policy should be transposed in your plan strategy. That is not what my understanding of the process was meant to be. And you'll be well aware, members, if you've dealt with plan policy statements, and I did a lot of work for those in years past, there are a large number of them. And to transpose that into local policy took some not inconsiderable amount of time. The next stage of the process is called the local policies plan. And conversely, the local policies, or most of them, are in the plan strategy document. We understood that was when that was meant to happen. But we are where we are. And maybe once we get our initial plan strategy with our local policies through, that will uh, remove that impediment moving forward because the plans will, um, you'll have hopefully a plan in place that you're reviewing in the future as opposed to having to start from scratch. So the first one maybe was always going to be more difficult. However, there are also, uh, within that context, other uh, barriers that have caused delay. And your, your question was if things could be done to help that process. Ultimately, I think we, we, we have asked that there needs to be a more written branch review, and that's looked at all aspects of this process. There's also the aspects of the engagement with the department. Many of the members may have been in councils historically when plans were done by the department, where the single biggest objector was the council um, for that area, and members wanted to bring their views to the table. Now we've got a role reversal where the single biggest objector, objector to our plan is the department. And, and we're, we're pulling our hair out. Um, you know, this is the department that seems to have a dual role. They're responsible for adoption of the plan, and yet they're doing a critique of the plan. And in doing that critique, in many ways, they're actually falling into areas that we think need to be tested through the independent examination. And that's part of the frustration. And if the intent had been all the policies and PPSs were to be kept for Northern Ireland PLC, 
then that should have been at the start of the system. Uh, or at least it could have been adapted for other areas. I, I appreciate most plans across Northern Ireland, their policies on flood risk, historic environment, natural heritage, or riders won't be a million miles different than the current policies. Um, and nor should they be, we should be taking account of that. In other areas, they may need to be different to recognise uh, local um, issues arising around housing, affordable housing, development in the countryside, so forth. Um, but there is a frustration there that we're continually being told this doesn't um, align absolutely and fully with the current policy. But it doesn't say that anywhere. It says we've got to take account of those documents. And we're quite content to go in and debate those issues. But both consultees and officials in the department, we think, have come at this from a perspective of um, almost trying to put roadblocks in our way in terms of bringing those documents forward. So there's a range of issues there around the guidance that's been issued. And on that point, um, there is no guidance on the adoption of plans. So here we are six years in. The guidance has been coming out as we've progressed the plans. And in some cases, um, Councillor Corlew, this in Belfast, some of the guidance issued after they produced parts of their plan about how you're meant to do it. Uh, you know, there should have been much more forethought given if you bring a new system into how is the system going to operate in reality and what the guidance should be. And there'd be less criticism of us going through the process and being more upfront of what they expect. Um, there are elements in there in the legislation I think are a bit inflexible as well in terms of interpretation. So there is an, an interlinkage there between legislation, guidance and policy. And uh, that's why in that one, I sort of endorsed the middle view that uh, maybe an independent expert review on the development plan system as, on its own, if we don't wind out the whole planning system, would be a benefit. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful now that because of the questions, the time's run down because, it, I mean, this could be a broader debate and I've met Karen before. Karen, you're welcome back. And I mean, there's a, there's a lot more questions and a lot more answers to come out of this. I mean, it'd be a longer debate, but I just need to narrow it down to give all the members an opportunity. Clearly, you would agree with the call that an independent working group should be established to, just like the CBA, with the task of improving the process of, of the development plans. Would, would you agree with that point from CBA? An independent working group, yeah. I, I think that might be useful, um, Councillor, or, or probably Councillor Boylan, <laughs> Mr. Boylan. Um, uh, and, but I think uh, we need to sort of just get that verified by the Milgay Executive um, going back so, to them. Sorry, but I, I, no, I appreciate that. I'll just quickly move forward. The, you mentioned developer contributions. I have one two other points I want to make. Developer contributions, I mean, they're currently un, underused. Would I be like to comment in relation to that, how they could be better used, and, and the issue you have in relation to that? I'll maybe give a view from this council and then let Karen maybe take a, a wider view. Um, the issue of developer contributions is, is often confused with the legislation around planning agreements. Planning agreement is a means to end, it's a legal agreement. But there is a fundamental um, missing piece of the jigsaw in Northern Ireland about developer contributions. And, and a bit like a lot of the legislation, um, it has copycatted the position primarily from England, which doesn't necessarily easily sit in the Northern Ireland context. So you've got a scenario where Karen had pointed out, we don't have powers for schools, um, healthcare, roads, regeneration, and these are all the areas that maybe developer contributions should be looking at. Um, if you look at our system of rates in Northern Ireland, our system of rates in Northern Ireland is different than the rest of the UK. But it works, and we have a regional rate, and we have a local rate. Our council, in putting forward its um, points to the department on the review of the planning act, has indicated that the council here uh, would support the potential reduction of a Northern Ireland-wide community levy based on the rate system. It's a bit like the infrastructure fund across the UK. Now, there are issues around treasury involvement, and this is a form of taxation. But that's a political issue for, I think, the department, the minister, and other ministers to get their heads around. Um, you want a degree of um, uh, uniformity as well, and I think that's why a potential community levy based on a regional levy and a local levy can work. Because the regional levy may take on board maybe 75 80% money needed for upgrade of infrastructure for water, which is a huge issue across all of Northern Ireland. Uh, upgrade of um, major roads infrastructure, 
in telecommunications infrastructure, drainage infrastructure, and so forth. Those matters could be determined at a regional level through the department and set a regional levy, with councils to come in with their local levy potentially uh, for the bits they're responsible for, community facilities, open space, etc. And that's a suggestion we've made um, uh, uh, taking forward. Affordable housing is another area where there's absolutely no planning policy in Northern Ireland uh, in any form of detail from government saying how you should take forward the integration of affordable housing through planning. Very difficult area, very difficult practical area, and one that could cause great delay in dealing with planning applications. One that Belfast has taken forward itself with great detail, but it was left to councils to try and sort it out because it wasn't sorted out pre-transfer, and we're doing our best in different circumstances. So wider developer contributions, there's definitely uh, something to be done there. Uh, from this council's perspective, based on advice I've given the council, uh, what I'd be suggesting is a Northern Ireland solution to a Northern Ireland problem, not copycatting the situation simply what they've got across the water, or indeed uh, down south. There, there's, there's a need to look at our unique system and come up with a unique solution. And, and try and overcome the barriers to that and bring it in such a way that the development industry understands it. It's simple, it's simple to apply, and it doesn't cause undue frustration by further delays in planning processing. And just to find the point, Chair, and then support one on one raise because it's been raised from myself, uh, whoever wants to answer it. I mean, um, in relation to a review of planning policy statements, John, I mean, from, from a rural background and from a rural setting, we know that. Um, these policies, especially developing the country side, and I mean, it's time we reviewed that. I, I don't believe um, they're meeting the needs of the rural people, but I mean, I'd just like, like to know your views in terms of some of the policy statements, and, and certainly maybe, maybe the rural one developing the country side, but it's, it, it's common at me, you know, people are asking questions. I think there's some issues that need to be looked at and addressed right across the board. So, if you have any comments in relation to that, and, and I'll leave it at that, because I'm mindful there's a number of questions coming for you, but there's a lot more things to be said. I don't care where you have any more, Stephen, um, fair play to for coming today. I mean, in terms of other representations or any other notes that you have to send the committee, because you've raised a number of issues. But just, just on the listen to the development of the country side that policy, Stephen, please. Sure, if I can maybe come in. Um... Uh, Mr. Boylan, I think maybe 22 pages is just a, bit, a big enough document for you to get to go through um, in relation to our responses. There's no further um, kind of supplementary information at the moment. Um, in relation to developer contributions, I mean, the, the key issue um, across the, the board is that relationship between government departments and councils because we don't have the same functions as elsewhere. And John has already uh, touched on it. And part of that is the financial flows between government and local government, and where you know, if, if councils collect uh, developer contributions, how they then work with the government departments to um, put whatever infrastructure is necessary on the ground. There, there, are, there are issues there that need to be really looked at. And again, it's, it's part of that uh, wider um, you know, central local working arrangements that, that need to be looked at. But John, sorry, if you can maybe come in there. Well, uh, specifically on the company side, and uh, it is one, Mr. Boyle, I know we could sit and debate for the next two or three hours on. Um, there will be different views on this in different areas, and I appreciate there are frustrations in, in, in policy, interpretation of policy. Uh, you need to be careful in the sense professionally I have a view on this, and there, you know, there would be those who still raise concerns of the overall quantum of rural development coming forward, which is not insignificant. There are still large in the countryside, particularly when back to our local development plan, the department is always at pains to say, uh, we've got to look at your growth strategy and how you're going to promote all this development in the settlements, which is what the RDS promotes, and yet there's so much development actually taking place in the countryside based on their policy, which is not actually supportive necessarily of some other elements of the RDS. Uh, but what I do think there's a need for is greater clarity. And um, the one issue that comes up time and time again as planners is, uh, the definition, for example, of an active farmer. Um, it's, it's all over the place. There, it needs to be something. Planning policy is meant to be something that people can read and interpret in a simple way and understand. Am I likely to get permission or not likely to get permission? There will always be judgment and professional assessment on there. But in terms of the principle of it, there needs to be some clear uh, guidance, uh, both at a central government level 
and we do obviously the, the power to bring it in at a local level. Um, so for example, in this council, um, infill policy we one of those members are aware of, uh, but some people are concerned with infill policy in the areas of, of sort of the Belfast area that it could lead to widespread rim development along the main roads coming into uh, even Belfast. And um, uh, our members sought to bring some clarity by indicating the sort of gap size that we're talking about, that it's not 120 metres, which is often what we get, which is most people's view far too big for a small gap. Um, so to clarify that. Meanwhile, they also felt there was some latitude to be given for Wallstead development, exceptionally. So it was a bit of give and take, and that's the local evidence coming to bear in terms of bringing policy forward. But it's a, it's a very thorny area. It's one there won't be uh, maybe widespread agreement on, but as I say, greater clarity is, is always better than leaving it just so open to interpretation that you get multiple arguments made again to delay processing of applications while you wait on that information. Okay, thank, thank you. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you for um, Karen, Stephen and John for coming along here this morning. This is a very important issue. And I would share the concerns in relation to the potential for this to be a light touch review. This needs to be a proper review and grasp the opportunity to make changes which will improve our planning system, not just for local people and residents, but also for businesses. I am also, however, conscious we have another presentation and deputation coming up after this, so I want to ensure that everyone gets a fair opportunity. So I'll try to keep my uh, my questions relatively brief. Um, just in relation to your, your um, presentation, it was outlined about the, the case for transfer of further powers to local government, particularly around roads and transport. Would there not be a concern that in relation to the transport of those, it would tra transfer of those, that the same situation would arise as it arose with planning, whereby the full cost associated with the service would not be transferred? Because my understanding from my previous time in Arts and North Downborough Council is that the full uh, costs and finances weren't transferred to the councils, and uh, as a result of that, the councils were having to bear some costs in relation to that. Chair, sure, if I can maybe take that one. Um, yes, that's a valid concern, uh, Mr. Muir, and uh, certainly there have been a number of lessons learnt um, as a result of the transfer of powers and uh, functions um, in 2015. Um, and one of those is that actually trying to get costing information that, that is at, at the level of detail that councils require to take on functions is actually quite difficult. Um, and uh, there was a, a few um, estimates that were, were made at that time that don't, don't necessarily bear fruit. There's a lot of work ongoing at the minute about cross-benefit analysis of local government reform and obviously we've got the auditor um, working on um, what's happening on planning and looking at the planning system as well. Um, I think that there needs to be a sensible conversation about it. But that doesn't mean to say that we should continue to normalise uh, local government. I mean, what are local government functions pretty much everywhere else are things like local roads, street lighting. I mean, even to the point in England, I think it's the parish councils that, that did the street lights. Um, whenever at the time, um, in 20, before 2015, whenever we engaged with um, the predecessor department to DFI um, to look at what could transfer and what they were willing to transfer to councils, the, the, we got a very limited list. Of things that were difficult to do and cost a lot, um, so we declined the opportunity at that point in time. We want an opportunity to reinvigorate that face shipping discussion and um, to look at what councils should and could be doing, how that's funded is a, a fundamental part of that conversation. Uh, but we can't have the conversation until we get people around the table to have it. Thank you, Karen. I think one of my issues is that, for example, in relation to regeneration powers, the failure to transfer those to district councils was a real missed opportunity. So that's something that I think should be right up the top of the agenda for transferring. Just one more question. In relation to planning policies, the, um, the district councils have an opportunity to set their own planning policies, but there is a risk that they would then diverge from what would be the Northern Ireland's desire around that. And I know there's particular examples where we're having district councils adopting different policies in different sort of directions, which are totally contrary to what the department and what northern, the sort of regional sort of direction that we want to strike. And I would be interested to know your view in relation to that and how we can try to address that level of divergence. This is really a question coming my way. Um, the, the issue here is no council has an adopted local uh, plan strategy with its local policies, and those local policies um, will be subject to debate um, through an independent examination. Um, 
which we think will rigorously assess those policies, the evidence base for them and the rationale behind them, and that if the independent body thinks that they are not um, taking adequate account of the regional direction, um, then they would have the power, I presume, because there's no guidance out there to tell us how it's going to be undertaken, but we presume that they will indicate that that's something they cannot uh, accept as part of the adopted plan strategy and recommend to the department that the policy needs to be amended. Possibly something debated to change words. Um, appreciate you having given an example. Uh, what I would point out uh, is across the water, and the intention was that the plan in its entirety will become a one-stop shop and provide the local policies for that area. Um, we are certainly at pains when we engage with our members, because obviously the plan is the, 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 the local council's plan, and it's been also engagement with members uh, to indicate what the current policy position is and uh, what we think the options are for change if necessitated. Um, I'd like to think there's no uh, significant divergence in our uh, policies. They are not worded exactly the same way as the current policies, and nor do I think should they have to be. Uh, the issue for us is that if you look at the framework in other jurisdictions, national policy is laid down as a framework. It is not an operational policy. But it's there to be interpreted locally to bring forward the more detailed local policy. In Northern Ireland, unfortunately, we inherited the detailed policy from the department, and we're now trying to generate that to local policy. But I think to reassure um, the member is that uh, if something is clearly at odds or um, significantly divergent from uh, the regional or national policy uh, issued by the department, um, I think that council is going to have to be able to justify that in front of an independent body uh, and sustain that, or otherwise they may find that they're not able to do so and they'll be directed to, to bring back something more in keeping with the national policy. Um, thank you very much. Just, just one quick question. My view is in relation to the LDPs, if there isn't change in that process, these LDPs are either never going to see the light of day, or by the time they're published, they're going to be outdated and irrelevant. Would you share that view that if unless we do do change around this, there's serious issues with regards to these LDPs? The, the, the difficulty with the first one, uh, Mr. Moore, is getting the first one out the door, and, and in some ways, the success will be measured on do we get some of these plan strategies adopted within the next year or two, and then move on to stage two. Once you have an adopted plan in place, then I think life could become somewhat easier if the legislation allows for that to become a living document to change over time. Um, we have worked very hard with our members that the vision and objectives for our plan is not something that's going to be ripped up after five years or 10 years or 15 years. That vision and objectives will hopefully be there for the long term. So if we've got that set, then it's how you interpret that through your policies and then ultimately through your zonings and designations. And I'd like to envisage that would become a living document. Um, so we're taking a lot of pain now, and maybe that's uh, the frustration of where we're at. But hopefully, um, it may once we go forward be somewhat easier. And um, I would pause to mention that obviously, if you look at the situation in England, where you see um, a government has come in with an agenda to effectively do the most fundamental review of its planning system in 40 years, um, I don't think that's what we're looking for at the moment because uh, we haven't even got our current system in place, and we need to get something urgently in place before we consider fundamental review. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Steve and Karen and John, uh, for the paper you submitted uh, to us, and also for your responses uh, this morning. John, I have to say, you're a font of knowledge, and um, there is no doubt that the plan and review that's taken place is limited and you know councils do need a suite of powers so that you can effectively discharge your duties and i think something that this committee needs to put a greater focus on um, is the transfer powers uh, that you've asked about uh, in order for you to do that so i think chair that's something we should talk about separately uh, because it's not really dependent on this review even though it is quite a limiting review um, John, when you talked about enforcement process and improving it, one of the um, one of the issues of enforcement um, that you also said in your submission to um, concerned the impact of COVID 
has had on the enforcement process with great periods uh, being given and enforcement ceasing. So could you elaborate on that, John? Um, I can only talk about this, uh, Councillor, uh, in relation to how we've interpreted what the Minister sent out, which I can fully understand at the, the start of the pandemic, which was that supermarkets, for example, need to be kept running and that they might be um, bringing uh, deliveries on, on social hours, uh, just for circumstances, and we shouldn't be um, maybe excessive in using our cars in, in those sort of instances. Um, this council um, did, uh, should we say, temporarily halt uh, routine enforcement. We did retain, however, the, the power and, and, and uh, indicated we, if something urgent came along, uh, protected trees to be cut down, of course, we're going to go out and, and deal with that, a list of buildings being abolished and so forth. We would deal with that as urgent issues. Um, in relation to other matters, nothing has left our books and we're now in a more economic recovery phase. So we have a record of a, a range of things that were raised at that time. Now, some of them were simply pandemic related. Uh, church services taking place in car parks adjacent to housing because they couldn't use the building, but that has uh, sort of disappeared and it's not really a long-standing issue. We have, however, however, had a number of buildings erected, particularly around hospitality businesses, uh, which, shall we say, we're being, um, uh, keeping a watching brief on. We're not going to intervene straight away, but there are a number of those that we would probably never grant planning permission to. Enforcement obviously has got a five-year uh, lead-in period in terms of it doesn't become immune until five years are up. So those are on our books and we will come back to them. And we have issued certain letters to people to say we're taking a temporary view on that, uh, but uh, longer term we will come back and the needs planning. Uh, you will be requested to submit an application or equally my advise you it's unlikely to be granted and you should take structures and so forth away. I think it was a reasonable response in the circumstances. Uh, provided to say it's used with a bit of common sense that um, clearly was something that was going on that would be totally unacceptable um, in the normal run of things we wouldn't equally accept it just because of COVID-19 but there were certain things that arising because of COVID-19 it was probably reasonable to take a lighter touch approach. Chair, if I can maybe come in on that um, just to, to let the committee know that the concerns expressed about enforcement were um, directly from NILGA members um, who were uh, I think are very keen to make sure that, that after uh, the many years that councils spent as, as objectors and, and influencers on the planning system um, and were had concerns about enforcement at that stage, that whenever whenever the, the function transferred to councils, that enforcement was done properly and um, uh, is, is seen to be done properly by, by other people. So there is a particular focus from elected members on enforcement there too. Um, Karen, can I pick up on that point? Because in the paper you, um, you stated that members have cited examples of repeated offenders able to exploit loopholes um, in the enforcement system. And so it, the question would be then what is the impact on the planning system when enforcement, obviously, listening to, listening to you today, isn't up to scratch? Uh, and they see that you propose the planning authorities should be able to issue enforcement notices. So how helpful uh, would that be? I, th I think um, possibly John might be well placed to comment on that, because I think, uh, John, there's an, a, a, a particular um, instance where there's a stop-start kind of approach to, to um, a business um, operating without uh, proper planning and regulation um, fairly locally to, to John. Um, and I think there's an enforcement notice um, has been served, John. Is that um, right from what we were talking about earlier on? Yeah. Um, there, there are always instances where you get the frustration of you investigate and then uh, before you take formal action, the breach is regularised. Uh, six months later, then it starts up again and you go through the process again. Um, we uh, had certain frustrations in this council area with some members around that, but we then used, uh, should we say, the discussions with the members for them to delegate additional powers to us on enforcement. Each council is slightly different. Um, in this council, uh, the service of enforcement notices was not delegated to officers. They had to go through the members. So we've been able uh, to uh, make life a bit easier by getting some additional delegated powers where members were aware that there were ongoing um, uh, routine issues that arose irregularly. 
And in that case, we then uh, used our powers to serve and enforce the so that if they tried to do it again, it was a straight breach and they could go to court. It's a difficult area. That you obviously rely on the fact that you enforce the regulations uh, to ensure the system works appropriately and properly. It was an interesting one when we transferred in that uh, my briefing to the members here was that uh, many members would have approached me as divisional planning manager in Balmina, you know, looking for a bit of latitude around enforcement and certain issues. I had to sort of point out to them, you're now in charge, and that when people breach the regulations, um, uh, not to put it too uh, unpolitely, but it's like putting two fingers in the air to the members of the council. And uh, that got the support from the members, and they've been very supportive in taking enforcement action where appropriate and necessary. Um, it, it is a very difficult area. I'm aware, for example, in, in the Republic of Ireland, um, breaches of planning control are actually an offence. But it doesn't mean they're rushing to the courts every time there's a minor breach because you've been overhanging gutter, for example. Um, but that, that's one way of looking at it. There has been some uh, concerns here that people, you know, take action and create forgiveness afterwards, and yet they pay the same fee as a normal person paying a planning application. Should there be some sort of disproportionate fee, you know, maybe double the fee or 50% more of the fee to try and discourage people? And um, there's always to be a discussion around fines. There is a uh, concern that planners will look at on occasion that you go through an awful lot of work, get in front of the courts, but you don't see that much on occasion actually coming from the courts. We have had some success here with what I would say are fines uh, much more than we've got in recent years, and that is having an impact and people are more aware of it and maybe less likely to offend. So there's maybe a bit of um, relationship building with DOJ and, and, and training judges that you know, planning enforcement is something that on occasion should be taken more seriously and not just a hundred pound fine and, and just, just a, a little building that's of no importance and so forth particularly where it's important to people who, who make that complaint and want to see action taken. Uh, it's always good when we're, when we're getting presentations like this to, uh, to hear solutions and proposals brought forward as you're doing uh, now. Can I go back to the poor quality of planning applications, just for clarity, that can be submitted and how this can delay the process? I know you talked about that, John, at length here, but you also talk about the need to create an, the application validation checklist to provide the guidance uh, to the applicants on what information that they should be submitting in order to speed up uh, the determination uh, process to, to improve the chance of getting permission, obviously being granted. So what um, efficiencies has this brought? For instance, have, have councils, some councils adopted this, and what efficiencies have it brought in, in terms of the deploying of that process? You know, has using the validation checklist speeded up? The turnaround period for grant and planning uh, applications because it's something that even though you're saying and you're right i think that this needs to be put into a statutory written and um, it seems like a no-brainer that that should happen but i think some um evidence may be being presented as how others have done this without even the statutory uh process being put in place and how that has helped to speed up the planning application process uh, there's two or uh, three strands to that. The first one is um, we haven't done it for a while, uh, but when we uh, took over powers, we, we engaged with, shall we say, the agents who did the bulk of applications in our area, both big and small. And we reinforced to them that uh, the better the information they submitted with their application, the quicker they were able to get things done. And some of the agents listened to that, some recognised that, some were just clearly aware of advising their clients if we don't get this in now it's going to delay matters other agents unfortunately still take the view if it's a valid application i've got it off my desk the, the clock's ticking and i just delay, I, can, I can blame the planners which is usually what happens the, the legislation for major planning applications for a small number has shown and there's other things involved like there's community engagement involved in it but we've used that process with the developers for major applications, the three month gap between we're going to make an application and uh, we have to do our community consultation, which can inform that. We use that for the PAD process, which we don't charge for, we bring them in, indicate what we think the issues are, what the concerns are, and what information we want on day one. Where we've got that information uh, from uh, the agents who deal with those and their uh, clients have come and met us as well. 
Uh, we've been able to turn around some of those major applications in good time. And uh, up the last, not this year just passed, unfortunately, just COVID and other issues. But for the two years prior to that, we met our major target in this council area. So it, it shows it can achieve things by going through that process. In terms of the normal applications, Belfast uh, has gone forward and introduced uh, informal local validation checklists. And that has had some impact by working with the agents to try and improve uh, the information they get. The frustration, however, is they still can't invalidate the application if they don't follow it. So it's been done by mutual consent, if you want to put it that way. The issue everywhere else is that this is a mandatory requirement. It is in the statute. And therefore, all councils take the view, um, if it is in the statute, they make the power to do it. Ourselves included, we have not done it at this stage. We would do it if we had the power to do it and see that will certainly, we think, um, impact on better applications coming in and progressing applications more effectively and efficiently. And it would take a lot of the um, frustration out of the engagement that, for instance, when we're meeting businesses, CBA and others, and people putting in for planning application. Now, I'm conscious what you said that some people might blame the planners. And that might be useful for someone who wants it just off the gas. But generally speaking, for developers and others, they want the planning process to be speeded up as quickly as possible. Thank you all for your responses here today. I find that really yeah. helpful. Chair, through, through you, Chair, um, I'm just I'm aware that the Belfast City Council have uh, reviewed their approach to validation checklists and they've uh, provided a, a copy of that review document to the department. So. If the committee would find it useful, I can ask them to see if they could forward that to you. Appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Hello there, uh, Karen, Stephen, and John. Again, this is an important area, and, and thanks for, the, for your presentation to date and answering questions. Um, looking at the key issues which have been highlighted by NOGA me members. I, I understand, and, and there's a lot of logic, and I would be supportive of some form of validation system. I get that. In, in terms of the enforcement process, um, it would be helpful if you could expand what other ideas there are from elsewhere to improve things. I mean, I see, see mention of possible fixed penalty motion, and, and John has just suggested um, a, a different fee for a retrospective uh, application. So, what other issues are, are appropriate to try and improve the enforcement? John, are you okay? Um, um, yeah. John, particularly if, if you could maybe come in on that, but just generally on the fixed penalty notices, I think we're recommending that we don't use them because they're of limited um, efficacy. You get chucked out at 12 o'clock. So, so what, what are you looking for? What 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 are the uh, extra powers that you need that you, could you are enforcing at the minute? So what needs to change? And from my perspective, um, as, as as Karen pointed out, I know that should we say, and uh, the reason this came from members, I guess, frustration around the enforcement process. I have to say, from my perspective, um, there are limited areas I I could suggest to improve. We mentioned them already. The fixed penalty notice it doesn't actually do anything because at the end of the day, it doesn't actually address the issue. And part of it is actually going to. Uh, the council does, does it encourage the, the, the person that you're serving it on it to react and, and actually respond to you? Well, if you use a fixed penalty notice, you can't take then formal enforcement action, so it doesn't actually address the issue. And that's why I don't, I don't think any council or Ireland used it. it. It sounds like a great power, um, but it has to be thought through as to what the intent is. If you actually want to address the breach of control, then you either have to serve a notice, get an application to regularise the issue, and um, just serving a, a fine on them. Basically, you find them, but they keep what they've got, and this doesn't actually address anything. And um, they can advert control, and um, again, it comes down to where there's a will, there's a way, and when you take a proactive approach, uh, display of an advert without consent is an offence, and therefore we can go straight to court. Um, but at the same time, uh, the fine continues for as long as they continue to display the unauthorised advert. So it uses the desired effect of getting rid of the unauthorised advert or getting an application through for something that might be acceptable. And uh, on that basis, we may withdraw the summons for uh, court action. For other cases, um, as you're well aware, building um, or using land without planning permission is not an offence. You can 
go and build a house tomorrow and anywhere in the field. Uh, we then have to go through the process of would we have accepted that? Should we serve a notice to get it taken away? And unfortunately, those investigative parts take a long time. And uh, as frustration builds up over that whole process between those who've complained about something and those who do it. Part of it is, part of it's got to be around the uh, measures, for example, um, in terms of outcomes. So one example could be even as a matter of policy. There's been examples, for example, of buildings and conservation areas and listed buildings uh, being taken away without consent. Now, that is a direct offence, and you can get fined for it, and significant fines, potentially. But the building's gone. Um, same with uh, protected trees, they're cut down, they're gone, they're not going to come back tomorrow. Uh, what you can do, at least with the TPO offence, is require them to replant, that in due course they don't get a benefit from taking the trees away, albeit it takes time and potentially a fine as well. With listed buildings and conservation areas, a clear policy position of saying, if you remove a building that was listed, uh, the start point will be that you should put it back again. Now, you're not putting back the original building, but if a developer understands that the benefit he gains is actually going to have to rebuild a replica of the building that's taken away, that would assist. That is not laid out in policy at the moment, for example. Um, the retrospective fees you've mentioned, you know, that if you have to pay a disproportionate fee for something you've done without consent, provided it's done um, correctly, you know, if somebody was building a house extension that was marginally beyond what they could build without planning permission, you don't necessarily want to throw quick but if somebody is blatantly ignoring planning laws and putting skips on land or containers on land or building a building, then yeah. there's some provision in there for a, a, a speedier way of dealing with that and uh, how we address it. But it is a difficult area. <clears throat> Uh, you've mentioned the, you mentioned the difference in powers uh, between different parts of the United Kingdom. One of the issues that I'm sure is an, uh, relevant here is the the absence of regeneration powers. Uh, and I was on the DS, so the Social Development Committee, when the regeneration bill stalled and uh, then never never came into being. Uh, to what extent is it uh, a missing section of the powers that local government needs? Um, through you, Chair, it's absolutely huge, and it's the one issue that all the councils are definitively saying we need to get um, as, as a par. Um, obviously, we've had a, a, a series of stumbles um, due to the, the uh, decision at the time not to take the legislation forward. Then we had um, an election. Obviously, the, the Assembly um, has had uh, its challenges, and now we've had the, the, the pandemic. So trying to get round again to getting that legislation in place has proved exceptionally problematic. Um, we don't have any hope, I don't think, of, of uh, anything coming through the Assembly in this mandate. So, But we, we need to prepare for going forward. We need to have a really firm footing um, for um, building on, on, on the legislation that we have. With, with Actually, it would be with DSC rather than um, DFI. Um, but certainly, um, to do planning properly, to affect face shaping locally, um, we need regenerations, like the, the prime um, piece that's missing. Okay, thank you. And then finally, um, uh, you have a section on this two-stage process, and I'm trying to understand it. With the, it refers to the LDP Local Development Plan, and then refers to, refers to LPP, which I don't know what is. It also refers to the DPD, the Development <laughs> Plan document. It also refers to DPS, so uh, there's a lot of jargon in there which I'm not understanding. So can you give me a better uh, understanding of what is wrong with the current process? Okay. Apologies, Chair. I should have provided a glossary or at least um, articulated the, the acronyms a bit more effectively. John, do you maybe want to come in on this one? I'll try and be brief because over over time. A local development plan uh, comprises two development plan documents, that's LDP and DPD. The two documents are a plan strategy and a local policies plan. As I said earlier, the plan strategy was meant to be a high-level document of your sort of growth ambitions, vision for your area. The intention was, if you set your strategic um, process forward, um, and in terms of growth, and if you take, for example, uh, your uh, Midney Stantrum, if the growth strategy had said uh, the amount of housing we need is 10,000 units, and we think that should be distributed in the following way. And we need X amount of land for economic growth, and we think that should be focused on Balamina, Larne, and Tarek. So you have your high-level 
and the evidence what you need is for your area. But you haven't shown where lines and maps. The intention was if that was agreed, that was to take away the arguments at the local policies plan stage, which is the lines and maps and designations, that you can get people arguing over the quantum combined with the location. So if somebody came in to put major housing in by um, uh, I'm thinking of smaller settlement in Carlock, you'd be going, no, Carlock's identified as only having 20 units, so we're not here to talk about 100 units, because that's already been agreed. That was the intent. So that clarifies the end of the documents. Um, it's still, in principle, is a good idea. The difficulty in delay has been that all the policies, you're talking about local policies plan, have had to be taken forward at the DPS stage, at the plan strategy stage, and that has caused a significant delay. Um, however, we are where we are, and as I said, if we get those through, that might make life a bit easier for the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, just at this stage, a wee bit of a warning in relation to your timings. We do have to finish here at one o'clock, and we have the uh, CBI and Renewable NI to come before us yet. So uh, on to Miss uh, Kimmins, please. Thanks, Sarah, um, and thank you all. I, I'll, I'll be brief. I suppose a lot has been covered, and I had to step out to take the calls. So apologies if I've covered stuff. If I'm covering stuff that's already been talked about, it's just John. You'd mentioned, um, particularly about the um, wastewater infrastructure, and, and as we know, and we've talked about it at length, and um, we are already at capacity right across the north. And I know in in Uri, um, it's a it's a particularly big issue. And um, so it was just to kind of get an, an idea how local council have dealt with wastewater capacity issues from a planning perspective. Um, and do you agree with the Construction Employers Federation? That planning permission shall be extended for those applications that can't get adopted sewage at this time. Um, and similarly, I suppose, just in talking about extent permission, it's something I've been raising throughout the pandemic around you know, the potential to extend planning permission where work hasn't been able to start due to COVID. Um, so it was just to get your thoughts on that as well. Um, we'll do the last one quickly. I think that issue's passed in the sense of. There's nothing in terms of construction work here in Arborough that can't take place at the moment. So people, it, it raised its head in the first month or two, but we got around those issues by workarounds, shall we say, and that hasn't been a, a significant issue since. Uh, the, the big issue in terms of wastewater, we're uh, dealing um, quarterly meetings with NIW to assess the issue in our own borough in relation to capacity, which is less by, um, here to do with capacity of the works, but increasingly to do with the capacity of the network to take the suit from the site to the works. And that's uh, an area which the, the committee may want to raise with NIW separately to, to get a better understanding of what's coming on. But we're all aware there's an infrastructure gap there and planning will not solve that. And as my mother used to say, you know, planning is not responsible for all the problems of the world and nor is it responsible for all the solutions. And, and this one it is to do with the infrastructure's lag behind growth and there needs to be investment in that infrastructure. Uh, you might have heard a bit about developer contributions earlier on, and there may be a role for that. Uh, but in relation to the plans, we have to take cognizance of it. NIW is in a difficult position that if planning permission is granted, then they feel duty bound to allow connection. Therefore, if there is a problem with the works and it cannot be resolved technically, then the new option ought to uh, recommend refusal. We have worked on, I say, workarounds about separation of stormwater from uh, sewage. Um, we're also looking, obviously, in some cases with uh, individual properties with empty tanks or package plants for developments. Not ideal, and we may be just storing up a problem for the future of all these private package plants. Again, an issue to be, be looked at in maybe some more detail elsewhere. For the development plan process, it, it's difficult because it could actually skew your growth in that there may be locations that can take more growth, but they're very small, whereas the large places like New York or Down Patrick have got a problem but you can't allow growth there because the infrastructure is not there. And a uh, simple answer, I don't know the solution. Um, we can work as best we can. Uh, the solution is actually investment in our, in our infrastructure. Planning permissions are not going to resolve that problem. They just are a um, now outcome of people looking to develop correctly, but being stymied because of infrastructure problems. Yeah, no, no, thanks for that, John. I suppose, like, I know even just locally, and we, when I was in council, we had got presentations um, from NI Water and that it's just detailing exactly what you've said. So, I mean, I think that is the key issue when, when, we, when we start to see, you know, we, we're all aware of the, the housing need, for example, 
And when we start to see that um, that actually can't, you know, that we can't meet the, that need because of, of um, wastewater capacity and the, the lack of infrastructure, I think that's um, when we're going to hit real problems. Just just two other things, um, just in relation to the local development plans as well. I mean, how do you think they can be improved to put decarbonisation at the heart of their plans? Obviously, that's something that we're talking about um, quite a lot, um, particularly in more recent times. And we had briefings last week um, from officials on decarbonisation as well. Um, and do you agree with the call from Renewable CNI that the legislation should be updated to ensure that the LDPs facilitate net zero, for example? Okay. Can I just do a yeah. um, the last one? I should have pointed out we we do use conditions on planning permissions here, but um, if you cannot connect, yeah, you have to show connection to the sewer network uh, or um, a package plant where water consents granted. That can be a solution. And increasingly, we've discussed with NIW that if a package plant does come in, they want it done in such a way that it can easily then reconnect to the sewer system when it is upgraded, and there is a you know, a safe workaround solution there. Um, decarbonisation. I have my own very firm view on this, I'm afraid, which is that I agree there is a time of emergency. I think we're all aware of people growing up, my own daughters and children looking at, um, you know, what are we going to do about these things? Uh, if we're serious about decarbonisation and net zero, then my view is we should look at the statutory building regulations. As I said, planning is not the solution to all problems. We just said that you know it's taken our development plans uh, six years to get this stage. Our plan strategy does not have a plan, a policy requiring net zero, nor does it have a policy requiring every house shall have an electric, uh, an electric connection for electric cars charging, which is another going to be a huge issue in the next couple of years. My view is if this is so drop dead important, then government should legislate. It's not a planning policy issue. Uh, because what are you going to do with all the properties that are already there? Uh, retrofit, um, you know, which is the mass for building stock. How are we going to do connectivity for electric car charging to the residential Belfast, Newry, Balamina or Derry? And these are matters that are going to have to be looked at differently. So planning policy, our plan does encourage this. It does recognise this and says we will look for zero carbon, we will look for and um, resilience in environmental terms. But my view is very much that uh, if you're waiting on a development plan to do that, you could be waiting for another 10 years. If it's that urgent, it needs to be done, thought about now and become mandatory. If we did it in our council area, but you didn't do it in your council area, where are the developers going to develop? It might be cheaper to develop in our area than your area. And um, so you bring an unequal playing field. So I think planning has got a role. I know many councils across the water have integrated that through local members into their planning policy. When you do local policy, a bit like legislation, you know that the impact the cost of that. Most of saying, I think it's a more modern issue than normal solution should be fine. Yeah, no, thank you. Um for that and just my last point you'd said in, in the brief it says that the department should issue clear and explicit guidance on um retain notification calling process to aid transparency it was just can you elaborate a wee bit in terms of the the, the lack of transparency then in, in current processes that you see the, the department's guidance i understand says they will only call in in exceptional cases i think that's what it said um, so those councils are always interested to know well, when would you call in. I think what we were trying to do, however, was link that to the fact that we're mandatorily we have to direct applications to the department, which often come back to us. I think what we're saying is if you took that away, then that would allow the guidance to come out on call in to be clear when they would call in. They always have the power of call in. Um, I don't think, for example, the minister should be calling in an application for a house in the countryside. You know, is that a regional ministerial issue? So they need to maybe set down what are the sort of general parameters they would be, want to see um, in terms of what would um, uh, lead to a potential call in. Always reserving the right that they, they can call in any individual application. There may be a particular circumstance, even on a house in the countryside, that they feel for some reason must be called in. Okay, no, that's fair enough. And I, I think that, that's a good point. Um, at least if people know what to expect. Um, then they can be aware of it. No, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you all. It's been a very informative um, presentation this morning. Thanks, Chair.
Thank you. And uh, we have a, a late runner here coming in. Uh, Dolores <laughs> Kelly has indicated she would like to ask some questions. Dolores. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm sorry about that. It's just, Chair, that uh, I noted at the outset that the NILCA representative said about, um, uh, about planning and the process, but it's my experience, certainly in my own local council area, that between that and the boundary exit scheme, a lot of senior planners left, which left a deficit in terms of expertise right across a number of the councils, and that money did not follow to local uh, authorities to the extent that they would have hoped and needed uh, whenever uh, the executive transferred the planning function. Uh, and, and I think we're still playing catch up. So it's, it's my experience that far from being a, a sharper process, it's actually uh, much delayed. And, and that much to do with the lack of uh, resources in terms of staffing, both within council level and indeed within some of the statutory consultees, for example, roads and NIW seems to hold up a substantive amount of that delay. I just wondered, from your own perspective, um, have you made catch up yet in terms of the resources? And if not, how do you, you know, how how's that to be fixed? Is it, uh, you know, up to the council in terms of uh, through the rates or through the planning fees, or should the executive? Uh, not to give a bit more in terms of financial support to councils, uh, because obviously construction plays such a huge part uh, of uh, the employment and, and supply chain in, in many businesses across Northern Ireland. Thanks, Chair. Chair, Chair if I can maybe come in on that. Yes. Certainly, um, the transfer of, of planning, the way it happened, for a reason, and it was to make sure that each council had an equal amount of resource that came across. And that was understandable, but it wasn't actually maybe fit for purpose because you have some councils who had much more of a workload than others, and that was um, they would have had to staffed up fairly quickly. Um, I think that um, certainly, the, if you look at how councils have dealt with the legacy applications and the speed that they have gone through the legacy applications, where you'll see that there has been a lot of catching up done, um, and that we are uh, meeting the requirements of, of uh, by and large. Um, to make sure that the applications that we receive are processed. I think the development planning issue is, is a slightly different thing. John maybe want to come in on that. Um, but certainly what Nilda would encourage is to look at um, how we can maybe work on a shared service basis for some services. So, for example, I mean, we, know we already work on shared service for property certificates for environmental um, um, assessment. Um, and I, I would sort of uh, think about maybe you know if we had some sort of shared service for um, architecture or urban design, which councils won't always be able to access. Um, so there, there's things there that we can maybe do together and, and as a self-help exercise. Resources from the, the, um, the gov from government obviously are, are um, absolutely essential, um, and particularly um, for our partners in the planning process. And John has already talked about resources in Northern Ireland water. That's fundamental. We need to get that sorted out fairly, fairly quickly. Um, but I mean, in relation to the um, the staff turnover, there's always going to be staff turnover, and I mean, I, I suppose it was like double dumps for us because we did have a lot of, of um, um, people moved out of councils and also moved out of government at the same time. There's been a lot of churn within the civil service too, as you know, and, and more than than DFI. And um, so it, it is. It's it's a symptom of where we are at the minute, but. I think actually considering all things being equal, we're doing pretty well. I mean, John, um, have you any comment on, on the staffing issues? Um, each, I need to be politic on what I say here. Each council uh, got slightly different um, resources given uh, work that was done. Uh, I do recognise and understand that um, some of that work was done and predicated on applications that were coming in with time pre-transfer. For example, in one council area, a lot of it was based on wind turbines, which suddenly then stopped coming in and a big fee drop occurred. Um, and the general point, there's two points to make on that, is, it is in our submission. Planning fees haven't gone up for five years, um, in effect, like one small uh, increase, and we've fallen behind. So there's an issue there. Um, there's an issue over uh, the ap other applications we deal with discharge conditions, non material changes and so forth, list of building and central planning applications. Uh, don't underestimate the number of applications that brings into the system, particularly after the crash in 2008, when people want their, their conditions discharged. It all takes time and effort, and uh, we don't get a penny for it. So there's an area there to consider charging. 
Uh, in terms of the overall resource issue, uh, I think the, the, the member has indicated the three areas. Councils do have the ability to, to increase the rates burden. They don't like doing it. Um, there is direct subvention, and we do get grant from the department. Uh, I think most would have said a, a bit more would uh, be helpful. And then the fee income. So uh, it is in and around that. Uh, and some councils have suffered. Uh, I did say, and I, I maybe you might be coming to the end, uh, I'd like to finish on a positive note. Um, despite everything we're saying, and despite the need for further change, that still has the system that's transferred. Uh, transfer overall, I believe, has been a, a huge success. It's put planning back where it should be, in the hands of local elected members making decisions. Uh, I think there have been improvements and ongoing improvements. In some places, take a bit longer. Uh, this is about um, reinforcing that uh, and maintaining that and giving us the ability to move better in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, no other members have indicated at this stage, so could I thank uh, Ms. Karen Smith, Councillor Stephen Core, and Mr. John Linden for their attendance this morning. It's been very useful, very informative, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Members, we move then to item 14, the briefing from the CBI Northern Ireland Review of the Implementation of the Planning Act. Uh, Hansard will record, record the meeting. At page 107, the CBI submission regarding the review of the implementation of the Planning Act Northern Ireland 2011 is contained. And at page 117, the renewable Northern Ireland submission regarding the review of the implementation of the Planning Act Northern Ireland 2011 has been tabled. Uh, we welcome on attending via Starleaf is Mr. Stuart Anderson, Senior Policy Officer of the CBI Northern Ireland. And Mr. Stephen Agnew, Head of Renewable NI. Uh, very welcome, gentlemen, to today's meeting. And uh, maybe you want to give us some opening statements. Okay, th uh, thank you, Chair and, 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 and committee members. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that you've been listening uh, to evidence on the Planning Act for some time, so I'll try to be um, as succinct as, as possible. I think from a CBI context, I think it's important to just to, to give you some context to, uh, in terms of our own interest in, in the review um, and in our submission. Um, we are a business member-led organisation, and through our engagement with members in early 2020, um, we started to look at the challenges with the performance and the efficiency of the Northern Ireland planning system in respect of major applications and regionally significant applications. And the, 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 the rationale behind this was following the Northern Ireland Audit Office report at the end of 2019 into major project delivery, which highlighted planning as a leading cause of delay. Um, so in order to build our evidence base and to draw a comparative study across administrations in the UK and Ireland, um, we worked with an independent expert in uh, Jim McKinnon, who was the former chief policy, or sorry, apologies, chief planning officer for Scotland, uh, to develop meaningful proposals to tackle the delays and inefficiencies. And those proposals form the basis for the substantive recommendations in our submission. Um, I think this, this review creates a timely opportunity for us all, and in particular the department and the planning authorities, to play a critical role in tackling the twin challenges, both of the economic recovery from COVID-19 and also in a, the transition to a net zero uh, economy and a net zero future. Um, at, you, you'll have our, our proposals in detail, um, but at the heart of them um, is a series of recommendations that we put down that we believe will be able, uh, that are inclusive and will be able to streamline uh, the process. And very quickly, um, I guess to give you our, our top priorities in that respect, number one um, would be to enhance the pre-application engagement and the consultation phase with a particular emphasis on the role of, of, of statutory consultees. Number two is to streamline the pre-application community consultation process, the PAC process, um, with the use of technology, uh, building on the learnings that we've had throughout the COVID uh, pandemic. And then finally, um, and, and perhaps somewhat controversially, um, in the eyes of some, the introduction 
of statutory timeframes for decision making. Um, our proposals frame planning not as a matter to be taken in isolation, um, but form a constituent part of um, what we believe needs to be a new overarching infrastructure, infrastructure delivery framework um, that enables prioritisation and, and delivery of needs into the longer term out to, to, to 2050. Um, if our planning system is to be the enabler that it needs to be, then we all need to use our best endeavours to, to, to achieve that. However, the reality is that timeframes for processing for major applications are now double the target. So it's very clear to us that the system is an impediment to progress rather than a facilitator of it. And if we're to have the change that we uh, are keen to d discuss this morning, we are conscious that the Assembly has declared a climate emergency, that a climate change bill is now pushed through the second stage um, to accelerate net zero delivery to 2045. We have an ambitious 70% renewable target by 2030. And taking all of that into consideration, our hope from our discussion this morning and in our further engagement with the committee is to, um, is to elevate the role of planning in the debate and in the discussion around our, our, our future. Um, so uh, thank you, Chair, for, for, for the opportunity, and I'll, I'll pass over to Stephen. Okay. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'll not add much more. Um, I can make sure members have plenty of time for questions, but as, as Stuart alluded to, um, we, we are facing a climate emergency and we need to act with the urgency that implies. And, and to do that and, and to have processes, I think, that facilitate that, um, we need to embed net zero, um, the net zero requirement within within our, 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 our planning system and and I suppose a particular concern to renewable NI has been um, some of the LDPs that are coming forward of the draft plan strategies that we've seen to date and um, their councils are required to take account of regional policy and um, well we we have a regional policy that in effect creates a presumption in favour of renewables but what we see coming forward is a number of draft plan strategies that in effect introduce a presumption against renewables and and and, and that tension i think needs to be re re resolved as Stuart alluded to the economy minister is 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 likely to introduce a, a strategy that sets a target of, of at least 70 percent renewable electricity that that's a, a real risk if if the the draft plan strategies that we've seen to date were to to end up in, in final LDPs. You know, what we need is a planning system that facilitates the energy transition. What we're seeing coming forward is proposals to frustrate the energy transition. Okay, thank you. Uh, Move then to questions, and uh, could I call at this stage, Keith Buchanan? Okay, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Stuart and Stephen. I was going to say you're looking well, Stephen, but then that'll be one be nice and Stuart, so just you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind. <laughs> you haven't aged, you haven't aged the moment for the you have. So uh, my question is to you, uh, Stephen. Just sort of two simple questions regarding statutory consultees. You've put a line in here, but you know. The council should then award plan permission if statutory consultees have been given ample time. I know that's a very generic line. What what's your sort of thoughts broader on statutory consultees, Stephen? And I suppose the the, the, the the amount of time it's taken for those people to feed back into the councils with their responses. I mean, it's incredible frustrating for our members. I I recently met with Minister Pooch on this this issue. We we collated data from our members and, and these aren't even the longest but typically for a wind farm application statutory consultees and um, particularly within NIEA will respond in typically 11 or 12 months and um, the target's 21 days now in the, in the conversation <laughs> with Minister Pritch, he said maybe 21 days isn't realistic for a wind farm but he did agree that also 12 months was was an unreasonable amount of delay so you know what we want we want realistic targets so that we know what what we're working to or, or realistic deadlines um and and if that means slightly longer than 21 days that's fine um as long as what we see is is consistency and sticking to those timelines and and some accountability for that because i i think that's our frustration there appears to be no accountability for statutory consultees and um, they're causing immense delay in the in the planning system and, and look 
don't get me wrong, in, in many cases that'll be due to lack of resourcing. So, you know, I, 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 I should be fair in, in citing the NIEA, no additional temporary resor- resources being put in place that has seen, seen things speed up. That, that, in my view, needs to be permanent, otherwise we'll get the backlog that they're, they're again, that they're currently trying to shift. So, um, as I say, it's, it's, it's realistic time frames. It's accountability for sticking to those time frames. Um, and, and then, I suppose, where, where it is breached, our, 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 our members, developers, we need to be able to move on with their projects. And um, if such re- check, uh, consultees don't respond in a timely fashion, well then, then their input won't be heard, and that 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 ultimately is you know should be the accountability mechanism. And, and Stephen, in the sector you represent, what's your experience over this past what, 14, 15 months? This whole working from home, that's not going to improve those times. What's your people saying to you? Well, to be fair, there, there, there was uh, a bit of delay at the start. I, I, I think to give credit where it's due, I think by and large. The system has adapted, and we've seen that with the the, 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 the pre-application process moving on to line or pre-application community consultation moving online. And I think once those adaptations were being made, um, you know, I I, I think that the, we we have seen the system adapt. So, I, you know, I think we as an industry are understanding every system was affected by COVID, um, and and had to adapt. That's taken place, and, and I suppose we're, we're appreciative of that. Okay, and final question then, Stephen, regarding your, your point at the sort of the last year report on battery storage. What is that? What is those changes back in was it sixteenth of December? In, in layman's terms, what do, what do they mean? If you give me a bit of a quick overview on that, Stephen. Just... Sure. Essentially, what was the case? If you put in a battery storage application, the council would have dealt with it, and and the system, in our view, was working. Um, what the chief planners update in December did was say that battery storage should be treated as generation, which effectively makes every battery, well, most battery storage applications um, assessed as regionally significant and has to go through the departments. That created a number of problems. It's more expensive. It takes longer. And to, to be honest, the department then, even when we do go through the department, doesn't seem to know what to do with battery storage applications. So. Our view was that was, in effect, a change of policy. It it created uncertainty around existing um, applications that had been given permission um, as to whether or not those permissions were were, were still valid. What we've been told is they're valid unless challenged. Um, And, you know, I suppose the effect has been, um, I'm aware of six wind farm applications that had battery storage projects co-located. And effectively, what they've done is removed the battery storage aspect of the application so that the wind farm can proceed because there's so much uncertainty um, about um, the, the ability to get a battery storage project through the planning system. You see that 400 megawatt of battery storage projects in active development. What is that? You know, many sites is that what's an average battery, battery storage facility in megawatt? The, 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 the typically, if you're sort of talking about utility scale, you know, the long side of wind farm, they're typically 50 megawatts. So, so uh, 400, uh, 450 megawatts is probably eight or nine projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Just as a supplementary to that on the sort of timelines we're speaking about, you've also indicated under the pre application community consultation that that potentially should, could be reduced, Stephen, from 12 to, to 8 weeks. Now, anything community based can always cause a bit of uh, angst from that. Like, w- w- what's your reasons for that? Is it coming from your own experience, or I, I think our members are, you know, they're work, working on multi-million pound projects. They, they they put a lot of investment into actually community engagement, and I suppose that, that's why there's a proviso if it's been demonstrated that the active consultations been taken place. You know, I, I think we're as an industry quite adept. At, at community consultation, we, we, we have um, as well embedded in our projects community benefit schemes. You know, so we, we, we try to maximise the benefit of, of the community and we see the advantages of get, engaging early. But it really is just trying to reduce those timelines. It, it, it takes typically in Northern Ireland 852 days for a wind farm application to go through the planning system. Um, it's 378 days in Great Britain, so it's more than double in, in Northern Ireland. It's taken typically over two years. It, it, it's really just looking at ways to, to improve the efficiency of the, of the system. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Deputy Chair, and thank you for Stephen and Stuart for coming um, here this afternoon. It's appreciated. Just in relation to for, for Stephen, the Department uh, recently announced a review in relation to renewable energy. And I think it's welcome that there would be a review in relation to policies around that so we can better encourage renewable energy. Do you have any concerns that that review could result in applications that are just going into the system or are currently in the system and the goalposts would be changing in relation to that, similar to what occurred around the battery storage issue and the implications that had? So that's the first question. Yeah, it, it is a concern. I mean, we certainly welcome the Minister's um, in, intention to ensure that the planning system um, is, is working alongside, as I say, facilitates the energy strategy rather than frustrates it. So so we, we do welcome that. But the, the, there's a lot good about the, the, the system we have at the moment, or at least the policy that's in place. Um, and, and it's making you know, in the meantime, making that more effective. Because we, if you look at the timelines, I think in answer to, to your question, Mr. Muir, the, the, the minister has said that um, the consultation will likely open in March next year, by March next year. Um, consultation maybe take a couple of months time to make decisions. You're maybe looking two years out before um, a, a, a new policy is in place. So in the interim, our members want to be developing wind turbines. It's a climate emergency. We need to act with urgency. So it's making the current system more efficient um, and, and, and deliver more quickly while we review how, how, how we can get it better. So it's, I suppose, two things happening in parallel, a review of current policy, but making the current policy deliver uh, more efficiently and more effectively. Thank you, Stephen. I'll, I'll touch upon that in a second. But one of the other issues is, is in terms of how the councils have now obviously got planning powers, and some of them are adopting uh, a direction which to me would be contrary to what the regional direction would be in terms of encouraging renewable energy. So I'll name it here, Mid and East Antrim, okay, in terms of what they've been doing. And there obviously is a view that this potentially could be resolved through the planning process in terms of the department's intervention. Do you have any faith that that could occur and what are your concerns around that? Um, yeah, so you know, Minnie Stantrum is, is, is one example, Darien Straban is another, so I'm not picking on one council. You know, Minnie Stantrum has proposed areas of constraint on high structure. And when you read the detail, it's clear what they mean is, is, is wind turbines and electricity pylons. Um, equally, Derry and Straban have, have been almost more explicit than they've introduced uh, or proposed to introduce um, wind energy capacity areas where they're saying, well, we, we have enough wind farms here, thanks. So, you know, that's very much running contrary to regional policy. And as I said in my intro, um, you know, they're supposed to take account of regional policy. They seem to be to be taking account of it and, and running up against it. Um, so uh, the, 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 the perception I've got from the department is is a very hands-off approach. Um, and they're, you know, they, they almost seem to be the facilitator sim almost simply passing on um, uh, draft plan strategies to the, the Plan and Appeals Commission for independent examination. I, I think there, there could be a more proactive approach when it's clear that a, a, a plan is likely to be judged unsound, to, to knock it back to the council at the first instance and say, look, this clearly contradicts regional policy. Um, it, it, it's unsound and, and therefore, you know, uh, get it right now before it goes to the independent um, examination panel. Thank you, Stephen, and I agree with that. I think it's disappointing the stance of the department to date in relation to this, and I think they do need to address that. And we can't wait for a review of renewable energy policy for that to be turned around. Uh, one of my other questions is more really perhaps for Stuart. Really, um, there's been a review of the 2011 Act. My understanding is that the initial outcome of that should come to this committee by the end of June, and. And we've got a real worry there could be an elongated process to make these changes that are required now to address those issues. Um, it is a view of the CPI that there's some of these changes can take place right now, rec not requiring legislation but require and an elongated process? And what are those changes that we could get made right now to improve our planning process? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. Certainly, one we've been thinking about with an eye to, I guess, the, the the performance of the assembly in terms of its ability to legislate and to legislate well and to legislate quickly. Um, in terms of your, in terms of what can be done, 
without the need of, of, of introduction of, of, of legislation. I guess one of our main proposals, and, and again based on evidence looking at what happens in, in other devolved administrations, is looking at what Scotland has done around uh, the introduction of processing agreements for, for complex cases. Um, I think it would be particularly useful around that pre-application stage. This is a effectively a project management tool um, entered into between both the applicant and, and the planning authority um, with a very clear indication of what's required at, at, at the various stages. And within that, then, you would have an agreed timetable, um, which, which, to be honest, from industry's perspective, you know, we, we do represent construction, but we also represent investors and planners and others in the process. Um, so from an investment perspective, the real challenge with Northern Ireland at the moment is whenever a, a, an investor looks at Northern Ireland and particularly with one eye to some of the foreign direct investment that we're looking at at the moment, and then they try to engage in the planning process, they, they have literally no idea um, when planning will be granted. And then you have the other questions of funding and, and, and the commercial and legal uh, discussions to take place. So um, in, in, in short, I think that one of the main changes that they can do um, is, is engage in, in, in those processing agreements for the, the, the major and reasonably significant um, developments. There is definitely some clarity as well can be brought around the, 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 the pre-application um, stage as well. I mean, PAD is a, is a, is a non-factory process at the moment. While we would like to see it in the statutory footing, um, some ministerial direction around the use of that process would engage uh, statutory consultees at that earlier stage. So um, I, I guess from a non-legislative position, that's what we would like to see um, you know, in, in, introduced as soon as possible. I think as well, when you consider Consider um, that the review is was delayed in the first instance, um, and then we and then commenced in in October. Um, my understanding from the chief planner was that the, uh, the the department was keen to introduce changes as and when, um, and I think it'd be a really positive step for the department to take um, any changes that they can as soon as they can. Um, thank you, Stuart. I think I know from my experience in North Down, one particular example of a business who put in a plan application and it took years to get approval. They were messed around by the statutory consultees and also then there was delays in terms of the council getting reports through and all the rest of it to the extent that their experience of the planning system was awful and it just put them off and I think we have to address that because the timescales that we have now and the aims are just not being met. And it's been interesting to know from yourself, how does that compare this experience and the processes that we have in Northern Ireland, how does that compare to other parts of the United Kingdom, for example? How, are, are they better, or, or, or and if they are, what are the things they do apart from the issues you've outlined in Scotland? Yeah, uh, again, this is why we had engaged an, an independent expert in 2020 to, to, to look at this and, and, and with his uh, uh, you know, expertise had, had looked at the various administrations and how they respond to it. I think on the face of it, even even in terms of targets in, in England and Wales, you've got the the the, the thirteen week target and in Scotland four months. The, 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 so the, the the targets are you know significantly lower than what they are here. And then in addition to that, the, the performance is particularly strong. So in England and Wales, the the, the, the success rate is particularly high. Um, and in Scotland, I think it's sitting in and around um, thirty three weeks for a for, for a major application on average. I think in terms of approaches. I guess what we would like to see, so you know, taking the context of climate emergency that the Assembly has declared, where we looked at other jurisdictions where there was a particular crisis, so in in, the, in, in Ireland where you had the uh, housing crisis and in 2016 a promise to deliver X amount of houses within an uh, accelerated period of time, um, they, they, they introduced the streamlined process for strategic housing developments um, and that has delivered in terms of a, a, an expedited process but again with statutory time frames for delivery so a 16 week time frame um, and I think it, you know, in looking at the process as a whole it's undoubtedly delivered in reducing what was an 82 week process I believe to an average of around um, 32 week from, from, from start to finish so again if we're looking at the context of a crisis then we need to ask, the, ask ourselves the exam question well if we're, we're setting targets how do we get to those targets and what role does planning play in that process? Thank you. And just one last question. Yesterday, the, uh, in this place, well, across the corridor, uh, we debated the budget and um, 
probably a quick summary of that is that the resource budget is largely frozen, standstill, but there is an increase in capital. So the department, for example, has got a 29% increase in capital uh, budget. But we still haven't seen any progress in terms of the establishment of an infrastructure commission, which to me is an important thing to be able to deal with some of the issues we are outlining in here today and get delivery on the ground. Now, it's probably fair to say there's not very long left in this mandate. We've got less than a year. Would there be any benefits, because I think we really do need progress in this, to establish the Infrastructure Commission without a statutory basis, but looking at bringing that in further, like we've done around the Fiscal Council, and just get cracking in relation to getting that Commission off the ground, or what your views are in relation to that? Yeah, it, 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 good question, and I guess why we separated out our recommendations in terms of the the, the, the longer term needs and, and creating uh, the, the the framework that looked to the the longer term. Um, I guess the, 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 one of the key drivers for an, an infrastructure commission was to uh, to to have an independent body that had sufficient powers. Um, and I guess a lot of the criticism that we would have in terms of our membership of SIB would be around the, its lack of statutory powers. So I would have a degree of caution uh, around that. However, I, I don't think it, it, I don't think we should, uh, by any means, die away from the reality that we need to have um, some form of expert-led independent body, as the ministerial advisory body um, had looked at in detail to manage this problem. And I think there should be some degree of impetus around that. But, it, but as I mentioned at the start, I think we need to separate it out. This is a challenge um, from, the, from the challenges in terms of streamlining the process, particularly whenever we're looking at the renewables target to, to, to 2030 um, and the lag time that it takes in terms of getting a, a project from, from planning stage through to, fi to, through to final construction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr Boylan? Yes, Chair, thanks very much. And Chair, I'm mindful of booked in all the meetings, so I'll try and I'll be as brief as possible. But uh, just to welcome Stuart and, and Stephen. I, I just want to follow on, Stuart, from then, and just to both of you. I mean, you, you've explained you, your experiences through COVID and everything else, but moving the context from climate action to building back better, Stuart, because I mean, you know, we're doing the review, there's going to be a decision made in a period of time, but clearly for your stabs and for the renewable sector, we need to see change. Now, you mentioned pod and different few things. Realistically, what are we looking at here? If we're serious about building back better, and you know, you know the impact COVID has had right across the board, uh, you usually want to play a major lead in, in relation to all that on your members. So my question is, what realistically can we do? What impacts has it had on your members so far? And that applies to both these across the board in terms of your both sectors. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Th 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 thank you for the the, 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 the question. I, 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 first of all, I would say I'm not sure that I would separate the issue of, of, of building back better from net zero. I think there, I'm not sure I would have them as, as mutually exclusive issues. But you know, I, I take the point. I think just around the, you know some of our recommendations, and I think. We need to be really careful here that we're not just talking about speeding up the process, we're talking about creating an, inf an efficient and inclusive process. So whenever we're talking about reducing the time frame for PAD, for instance, that's not just a reduction in the time frame. That's about taking the learnings from COVID where we've been able to engage perhaps excluded parts of the community before through remote uh, through, through remote engagement, not, not necessarily just talking about doing what they're not talking about doing away with the time frame or the public event, but actually maximizing the benefit of, of, of what we've learned in terms of digitalization. I think in terms of the bigger question of Build Back Better, just looking at, at, at Andrew Muir's question, our big piece on that is the Infrastructure Commission. And in our submissions to the panel, we're very clear that the definition of infrastructure has to be broad. It has to include digital. It has to go um, into those in, into those bigger societal questions of regional imbalance and inclusivity. But that needs to be looked at in the longer term because some of the issues we have in our society can't be dealt with this year. They have to be dealt with with a very clear and structured long-term plan. And in our view, we, we can't be set by short-term political agenda. We have to look at expert-led long-term views. And that's the role that an infrastructure with appropriate statutory powers can play. Yeah, and uh, I agree with everything Stuart said, and, and, and don't have a lot to add, but it, it, it really is, as I alluded to earlier, even the timeframes we have 
and, and stick to those, you know, the, the time frames and the targets. If we could even just get, you know, before the the, the implementation of the review of the plan, neck like before the renew of renewables policy, if we can stick to the time frames we have and, and really pick the resource if that's what's needed or the accountability, you know, um, in, in place to make sure that we deliver on those time frames. We really can build back better and build back quicker, um, but you know, we, 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 there's enough with our existing processes that, that, that we can take the urgent action we need, um, but we, we, we need to take our, our statutory timeframes and our targets seriously. Well, thanks very much. And, and sure, no, I didn't mean that. There's all these buzzwords now and how we're going to go over <laughs> And I mean, in that context, and you're right, we've got to get the system right, but we need to look at how we get it right. And it's inefficient at the minute in terms of some of the time frames. And I mentioned in that context, and I appreciate it. And unfortunately, I have to go. I have to go to another meeting. But your apologies, and thank you very much for attendance today at the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Steve. Um, there's no doubt, uh, listening to you and reading the documentation, that delays and indecision uh, within the planning process, you know, adds um, unnecessary cost, and also in terms of to our decarbonisation efforts. But how much of an obstacle is the defunct plan system uh, to achieving decarbonisation? And I see from your submission that you've called for the prioritisation of green infrastructure projects within the system. So could you expand on that as well? Yeah, I'll maybe let Stephen take that one first and I'll come in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, I was asked at a conference once, you know, what, what, what keeps you awake at night? And I, I kind of did say our planning system, you know, and in, in, in terms of meeting our renewable targets, you know, I, I, I think the Department for Economy, whilst we'll, you know, have our own view, we, we're proposing an 80% target, we're currently there, they're, they're suggesting a 70% target, you know, but but that's almost equivalent to some extent, we're, we're heading in the right direction with the energy strategy, but the, the, the planning system is the, the biggest barrier, and, and particularly if, if some of the draft LDPs, as, as, as they are drafted, um, are, are, are put in place. So, you know, uh, we, 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 we've made your concerns with that and, and really one of the, the elements of the the energy strategy is is a proposed extension of the the great britain contracts for difference mechanism without going too much into the detail of that it's a competitive mechanism and it would potentially mean northern ireland projects competing with projects in great britain as i said before projects here spend over two years in planning and um, it's less than half that in in great britain so um we you know we could find ourselves in the system whereby we're expected to keep them beat um, and have no realistic prospect of doing so. So th those are the risks, you know, the, the policies need to align, the energy strategy along with the planning system, the, the, you know, they, they need to step together. Um, Stephen, can I ask you, because I'm conscious about what you said about Darren Shaban um, in terms of the wind capacity? Very capacity, and I'll probe into that in, in, in a little bit more detail in, the, in this constituency. But Stephen, um, a few weeks ago, Sony had highlighted a substantive block that they say is to the 2030 energy target because they're saying a lot of the North's renewable energy production is produced in the Northwest, whereas the, the most uh, power hungry companies are located uh, in the east um, of the North. So uh, we need to to concentrate, I think, renewable generation and consumption in areas like the Northwest, where renewable energy grids are stronger. And there are issues in plan with regards to the development of hydrogen technology. Um, and I would like to just hear your views on that, because I've been sort of working with, uh, with a number of investors in terms of dairy and the potential Northwest to try to fit and match it better as opposed to what's currently uh, the situation at the moment and it has been highlighted by Sony. Yeah, no, I mean, a number of points on that, certainly on, on 
Northwest specific issues would be be delighted to meet with you and, and, and sort of discuss our concerns. But yeah, as, you know, as, as as you highlight, the generation the, the best wind speeds are typically in in the north and, and the west, and um, and that's where we set the generation where the demands in the east. Now, one of Sony's proposals is can we move more of the demand to the west, and and that maybe makes sense in an ROI. Um, uh, framework whereby you've big data centers and if you can can get them to site where the generation is that that's um you know be really beneficial i'm not sure how much potential there is to do that in in northern ireland but i i think and i i, I hope um you know as, as as a former member um i'd have heard heard colleagues such as yours and um and others talk about the need for investment in northwest and here's an industry that absolutely wants to invest in the northwest um, and, and bring jobs and bring investment and and, and stimulate the economy and and, and we, we we're starting to feel like we're not welcome and I, I don't want to put it too strongly but that's that when we see terms like wind energy capacity areas that's what it feels like and, and I did hear one local councillor when when someone proposed going somewhere else and one of our members proposed going to a new area was told well why don't you go to the areas We've already developed wind farms and build out more, but we're also being told not to do that. So we, we, we kind of feel wherever we go, um, we're, 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 we're facing um, an objection. You know, we want to work with local communities, councillors and indeed MLAs to, to, to find a resolution to this because we do want to invest. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I mean, I estimate um, that the GV80% renewables um, would take an extra over one billion of private investment, you know, that that's something to be welcome, but we have to find a way of facilitating that. Can I ask you just um, one last, because I'm conscious of time, one last question. On top of this planning review, the Minister's decided to review the strategic planning policy on renewables and low carbon energy, and, um, and what, what would you like to see just coming out of that review? I mean, it'll be interesting to see the, the, the consultation when it arrives, but I think the main thing for us is, is, is net zero being embedded and, and, you know, connecting better regional policy with local policy. I think, um, and you know, I talked about it before at the minute, there, there seems to be quite a bit of tension. And it, you know, it's, it's again getting the local and regional policies stepping together rather than coming up against each other. Okay, Stephen, thanks for that. Thanks, Stuart. I'm just conscious of time. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Kimmins. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Stephen and Stuart, for, for this morning's presentation. I have just two questions, and it kind of leads on from the previous briefing we had. Um, I'd raise the issue of, of extending planning applications, um, you know, in, in, in the context of COVID's impact of developments, and, and I had been advised that. Um, by, by the previous speakers that they felt that we, you know, this was no longer relevant because they were able to find workarounds um, to, to any that had experienced issues at the beginning. But I suppose I wanted to raise it with yourselves as well because I've seen um, Stephen and Stephen's submission and um, that it, you, you did discuss the extension um, in the context of renewable energy projects. So it was just to kind of get your thoughts on that and, and if you think it's still something that would be relevant. Yeah, if I, if I could come in, and um, in terms of us, yes, there was some delay with COVID, but what also is is a, is a big delay is, is grid connection. So again, while we're seeing investments delayed in grid connection, because we in effect, had, once we met our targets, and, and, and I think we hit our 40% target around about 2018, it was, it was target for 2020, there, there's, there's been little or no new investment in the grid. So sometimes our members have planning applications in, but can't get grid connections. And you know, so through no fault of their own, they're not able to progress. The, the, the planning application so there the, you know there can be a number of policy areas that need to come together to to make a a, a wind farm application uh, you know to, to to get the necessary consents for it to progress and and so when we add those together it is con causing considerable delay um, and that's where our members are, are looking for those extensions um to to ensure that you know projects that are otherwise viable can um, come to fruition yeah, no, thank you. And I, I mean, I th and that's kind of the point I was hoping to address. That I think that it is something we could st should still be looking at um, to try and, and help with with that uh, those issues. And just the second point, really, um, 
you, you, you made a call for the independent working group to be established, and which would improve, you know, in your view, the entire LDP process. And I had mentioned this in the last briefing as well. But you, could you expand a wee bit more on that and just to give us an idea, I suppose, how you see the group working with councils? Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll, I'll take that in the first instance. I think, I think first of all, I think we're we're kind of in the depths of the current uh, process, and I think we we, we leave that uh, as it is um, as as much as we can. So, um, I think the notion is that we develop a, a, a working group that looks very clearly at, at, at where the where the challenges are, um, in particular with in particular the the role of DFI. Um, and also um, the, the the challenges with the two stage process. One of the key things I think a working group can do and should do is look at a, do a comparative exercise both with Ireland and and, and, and GB um, and the other devolved administrations. Um, and I think the, the 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 constitution of that group needs to be very carefully managed as well and has to work very closely with councils um, in, in in developing the uh, in developing the policies. I guess um, it's a it, it's a principle um, that needs further discussion and, and, and further uh, and needs to be further worked through. Um, but I think um, you know at this point we, we really do need to have a kind of collective collaborative view on how we improve our, 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 our LDPs um, and, and bringing in expertise um, from other administrations where we can where, where we can make those key learnings is, is critical to that. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Sure, that, that's all. That's all my questions. Thank you both for, for your answers there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Kelly. I'm just can't, yeah. Um, th thanks for your presentation, Stuart and Stephen. It's good to see you again. You're looking so well. Um, on page two of your briefing, which which is very helpful, you, you reference skills and resources, which is an issue I raised with Nilga. Um, I just wondered. Uh, and, and from what I can see and, and experienced uh, is that there's a lack of skills and resources uh, in terms of seniority in particular and, and experience within uh, planning services uh, in different uh, councils. And also, um, uh, I've always looked at the spatial planning opportunities, you know, on a cross-border basis, north-south, and the differentials there is, and you reference that as well, in, in terms of how the south operates. And you, you particularly mentioned the absence of an independent examination process in the Republic and the difference that that makes to the uh, expediency uh, of the planning. I'm just wondering um, if that were to be removed, you know, what confidence will there be in um, people who want to influence or appeal some of the planning decisions or will it not have any impact really or what else would that uh, be provided for if there wasn't that uh, process in place? Yeah, look, I, I think probably two comments on that. We're not asking for the independent examination process to be removed, but just a reflection upon the fact that in, in the South, they're able to maintain updated plans and there is no independent examination process and it would form part of that working group view um, and in particular, um, that the, in particular um, taking a view of the, the, the two-stage process and how that squares with, with independent examination. So I think that's a, a, a key point for discussion in the working group that would be established to look um, at that at that particular question. My apologies. What was your your first question? It's just slipped my mind. So. It, it, it's actually in the round the skills and resources. I mean, in, in my council area, ABC, for example, uh, there was a key member of staff unavailable uh, uh, over the past year, and the whole area plan process review, if you like, has been put on hold. And we yeah. know that the pandemic is and, and people. Uh, uh, change in work patterns in terms of flexibilities around work from home is going to massively change our town centre profile. Uh, I just wondered um, what, what comments you had on that or how do you think that would be improved? And, and, and we know also that uh, the, the part of the outcome of the process, particularly around urban regeneration and, and boundaries around town centre planning, does negatively impact uh, businesses and, and areas outside of the town centre boundary and yet there's, there's no fleet of foot, you know, or no flexibility, I don't think, 
put into the, the system um, and to, to reflect that and how uh, then, uh, and, and Stephen will know this both as a, pub, a, a previous political and public representative, that whilst everybody wants to see the wind turbines and the renewable energy resources, Nobody wants them beside them. It's a bit like bus shelters a bit, you know. Um, I, I just wonder, uh, in terms of better education and, and um, looking ahead to technologies coming down the stream, how do you instill confidence in people and reduce their concerns but maximise the opportunities for renewables? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe come in first um, uh, on the question around skills and, and, and resources. And yeah, certainly that's that's always a challenge that's presented from industry's perspective when engaging with the process. And there is an acknowledgement that there is a resource problem there due to the, 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 the type of fiscal restraints. And you know, hopefully the work of the Fiscal Council will have direct benefits through time um, in relation to that. But in terms of the immediate concern, I mean, the, the Department of Economy has a fully funded economic recovery action plan. And two key pillars of that, one green recovery and another one, uh, a highly skilled and agile workforce that's fully funded. I guess the question is for how, how the department and how, how planning authorities engage fully with that to, to address those particular um, to address those particular deficits. But I think as well there's a there's a concern around the prioritisation of resource as well. So unless you start to tighten up the uh, statutory obligations of statutory consultees, and unless you start to st tighten up. Um, obligations around statutory timeframes for determinations, that prioritisation isn't going to happen and the focus has to be on the outcomes to prioritise the resource. Just coming in on the, the public perception, first I have to say, shirts sure getting off lightly. He's a former elected representative in his own right, a uh, former councillor in Arts and North Down. Um, but on, on the public perception issue of, of support for wind turbines, Northern Ireland actually um, Bays, the, the UK government department, does a public attitudes tracker, and Northern Ireland consistently comes out with the highest level of support for renewables, currently putting it around about 85% support. Now, we, we haven't done our own local survey, but colleagues in um, Renewable UK um, did a survey that shows even where the wind farms exist, you know, there's this perception that nobody wants them in their own area. Well, the reality is once they're there and they're developed, most people are, are, are quite content. There will, of course, I don't think there's ever been an energy project that hasn't um, faced some opposition, but it, 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 I think there's a problem in our planning system generally that it's quite oppositional. You know, nobody comes out, we'll, we'll see people come out on those streets campaigning for action on climate change, but they won't necessarily come out and campaign for a wind farm application. Um, and, you know, so we, we, we only hear the objectors versus the developer, that's almost how it sets up and, you know, in my old rule, but I, I continue it in this rule, I think the idea of citizens' assemblies where we, we, we really kind of, you know, flesh these things out and, and, and put it within a wider context because, you know, we, we, we every local rep, every elected rep sees it that, um, you know, when it comes to your RE, you'll hear the opposition, but we need to find some better way of hearing what people's views are on the overall context, as well as their own local area. I would agree with you there, Stephen. I mean, there's usually some vested interest at times as well, unfortunately. Um, but I, d I didn't realise that, Stuart. My apologies, or I would have uh, <laughs> uh, you a bit more there, really, but not really. It's not my style, of course. But, uh, I could just pick up those, George. You referenced the, the Fiscal Council. It's my understanding that that hasn't received executive approval, and that's maybe something that the committee chair might want to reference across to uh, the Finance Committee, if, uh, whether or not that has got to go ahead, given that um, you know we're going to rely on it to, um, uh, to have a look at some a greater, a closer examination on the processes. But they, uh, I do agree with you around the working smarter, not harder type. Mm. Yeah. And some of those things could be easily fixed, I would agree. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Thanks. Mr. Beggs. Hello, Stuart and Stephen. Uh, again, just so to have this, this engagement. A couple of points I'd like to delve a little bit further into. The, the times for major applications, the, the target was 30 weeks. And we've been gradually moving uh, in, in your the evidence you're providing us from uh, 50 weeks to 60, almost 60 weeks. Now, that was 
uh, finishing in 1920, which is pre-COVID. So, so my question is, have you any assessment as to why it's taking twice as long? Why, what, what are the department doing wrong that it's taking twice as long to uh, process a major uh, planning application than what the target time is? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole host of, 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 of answers to that question. And I think it starts with a pre-application process in itself. Um, so I, I think the role of the statutory consultees is referred to and referred to um, repeatedly. Um, I think the complexity, uh, particularly whenever you introduce the um, EIAs, for example, has, has a particularly significant impact on reaching the target. I think there is probably a need for a meaningful conversation as to how realistic those targets are at this moment in time and, the, and then um, work from there. I also think you, you, you have to focus on outcomes as well. And when, as I mentioned, when you look at the approach in the, in, in the South around the strategic housing developments, where you set down statutory timeframes, it focuses minds and then therefore drives uh, improvements and efficiencies. Um, and having that caveated with the need for sound decision making so that it's not just fast decisions, but they are efficient. Um, so we, it, it, it's, it's looking at the very beginning of the process um, and being able to uh, understand, um, what, what, uh, being able to understand um, what the potential risks are around late requests for information, and in particular the role of, of statutory consultees. But I think if you introduce things like um, a, a mandatory pad process and processing agreements, it can it can go a long way in resolving those issues. To to what extent, um, um, if any. Uh, have uh, uh, sorry, phones going in the background here. I'm trying to stop. To what extent have, have any um, uh, has uh, the lab information coming from the applicants perhaps contributed? Is 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 that an issue? Is that significant? Issue? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is an issue, and look, there's an issue that's accepted in, 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 in industry that, you know, sometimes the quality of those applications coming forward are, 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 not as the, are, not, are not as they should be. However, if you've got a significant investment coming into a particular project, um, you know, industry will, 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 will put all its effort into ensuring that the process um, is, is, is adhered to and, and followed. Um, but again, back to the, 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 the original point, if you can get to a place where you have a firm and very clear pre-application process, where everybody knows what they're doing and everybody knows what's required, um, that it, that you know that is how you know those mistakes or those errors or those omissions from uh, initial applications can be addressed. Can you perhaps expand a little bit more in, uh, in, in your document you've alluded, Stuart, to the um, non-statutory processing agreements in Scotland? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, again, they were introduced in, in, in Scotland largely to deal with complex cases and certainly Scottish Government would be very keen to, to encourage their use in complex cases in, in, in where, where you've got a major application. Um, what it is is effectively a non-binding agreement between a planning authority and the applicant which sets out an agreed timetable for the process starting at the pre-application stage through to the consultation phase um, and, and, and then the determination itself. Um, as I mentioned, it, it, it's non-binding, but the evidence suggests that where they are used um, in the vast majority of cases, the, 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 the timetable is actually adhered to and the determination is reached within that time frame. And all it does is it provided you can manage to get that engagement at that early stage, is that, and everybody knows what they should be doing and when they should be doing it, then it's proven to be um, successful, but again, largely dependent on the willingness of engagement in that early um, in, in, in that uh, early early stage of the process. Uh, and has has that come by diverting uh, resources from other planning applications to concentrate on on these major ones? So does everybody else suffer, or is it just the planning service focusing their mind and, and doing their job properly with, um, and efficiently? 
Um, not to my knowledge, and, and I, I think we have to be clear here that the challenge at the moment is with delays in relation to major and reasonably significant applications. So that's where the focus of our attention is in terms of the problem and in terms of our membership. Um, I, you know, in terms of the, the the local applications, I'm probably not the best place to answer um, that, that that question. But you know, that that is where the um, that's where the focus of our attention is because that's where the crux of the problem is. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, thank you. And, and can I thank you both for your detailed written briefing? And, and can I apologise for missing your presentation? It's the challenges of taking a migraine at the start of a committee when, when you're the chair. Um, so I, I won't ask any questions at this stage, but I'm, I am confident that members of the committee will have um, covered the issue. Um, but I will endeavour to, to read Hansard and get back to you if I feel that there's anything further that needs clarification. Um, so can I, do, can I thank you both again um, for your presence here today uh, and for the information that you provided, which I think will be very helpful whenever we meet with officials at, at next week's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, members. Um, uh, Ms Kelly, you, you mentioned something which I didn't quite pick up that you wanted referred perhaps and want to pick up with the Finance Committee. Could you perhaps elaborate on that? Yeah. Chair, it was just in, in, an, in answer to my um, question about the absence of an independent examination process, which is the case in the south of, of Ireland. Um, the, 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 the steward, I think, referenced that the work of the Fiscal Council uh, might address um, some of those uh, issues because my question was about um, if there was no um, ex examination process, how would uh, the people who wanted to appeal decisions or raise concerns be able to have their um, concerns raised? And they replied in response that this might be some work that the Fiscal Council might delve into, but it was my understanding that the Fiscal Council hasn't yet received executive approval and just wanted to uh, wondered if the finance committee uh, uh, knew that to be the case, and therefore that looking towards a fiscal council to address this particular issue might not be something that is coming any time soon. Okay, so are, are members content that we write to the committee just in relation to the issues sort of pertinent to this? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, moving then to our forward work programme at page 126. You will note that for next week we did have tentatively put in um, the briefing from um, RAISE. Unfortunately, our researcher is still off due to illness, so the briefing um, on the survey and, and stakeholder findings um, connected to our inquiry, we're going to have to delay that perhaps for another um, week or so. So if, if, if members are um, cognizant of that, content to to note the forward work program. Yeah. Okay. Um, do members have any other business which they wish to raise at this point? Can I raise just one thing and tell me, forgive my ignorance around this, but one thing that's been particularly raising its head locally is around utilities digging up roads and pavements and leaving them in a terrible state. And I was trying to find out what the law is around this, who's got responsibilities, and how we can address this because. There's residents who are, you know, one lady I know, she's, um, she's blind, trip, 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 risks of falling and stuff like that, and trying to contact some of the utilities is very difficult. But when you get to speak to someone, they're like, no, we're allowed to do this. And I don't know whether we ask Ray's to do a short research paper in terms of what the, what the score is in relation to this and how other places deal with it. But as Davy says, it is shocking. People, local people are very high pride, and that's right. And then outside, it's just like a battlefield. Yes, I know, and this becomes a problem now. Whenever there's something which has been newly resurfaced, and while oh, the, and while DFI go to lengths to consult with the various utilities um, that they want to disturb an area for a period of time, yeah. if there are emergencies which need to happen, which of course that will then. I mean, I've had a situation just in my own village. And within two weeks of a new area being tarmacked, that utilities in, and you know it's just horrendous. And you've been waiting for years um, to get it resurfaced. But um, I think 
this might be something we want to speak to the department directly on um, and just raise the issue around utilities because I mean I I kind of been battling this one as well in that you know they only will do a patch rather than actually doing a stretch of area because that then creates its own problems yeah. around and creates hazards. Um, so we may want to um, I think we should have a if we write to them um, and we ask them to um, come back to us just with. Um, how they engage and obviously um, you know, the reinstatement yeah. and the quality of the reinstatement quality is very, very poor um, and it's about how they, how they can really address that going forward. Okay, anything else? Oh, Miss Anderson. Uh, Chair, just on another matter, I'm sure all of the other members are the same, but the transport sector is still calling out for support and contacting us uh, with regards to that. And we've been receiving many emails and letters from small bus operators and taxi operators and taxi drivers calling for better support uh, and for that to be coming forward now. So could we ask for an update from the minister over this important issue? You know that previously she stated that the executive will need to consider how support and funding will be taken forward for all areas of the economy and um, for this financial year, but I would also argue that the transport sector needs a lead in this and needs a leader and that the minister should be taking the lead just to find out if there's any additional support coming forward. So could we ask for an update, please? Okay, I think we have, we have an outstanding request, have we, for that? Certainly we're meeting, as you know, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. with the, the bus companies. And I think, are we scheduled? Have we a meeting scheduled with the uh, taxi operators? Yes, we do. That's on the no, that's on the twenty third of June. But obviously, mm -hmm. we would like to have information in advance of that, if that was possible. If that has, if that's not outstanding, <coughs> then we can certainly do that. If members are agreed. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone else at this stage? No. Okay. Okay. So the um, the next meeting will take place at ten a.m. on Wednesday, the second of June, in the Senate Chamber where we will be receiving a briefing from industry representatives on commercial bus service permits and transport integration. And we will also have a departmental briefing on the review of planning policy and low carbon energy. So if members are content, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.